Welcome to the Geek Home World. I am your host, Ed, aka Savage Tech Man. We talk sci fi, TV, movies, superheroes, and all from a geek perspective. You can find us on Blogger, Google, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. We're everywhere. Join the Geek Home World. Hello everyone, this is Savage Tech Man, a.k.a. Ed, and welcome to another exciting, and this is truly exciting, episode of the Geek Homeworld podcast. Uh, you can find us on geekhomeworld.libson.com, we're on iTunes, we've got a YouTube page that we're trying to grow there, so check that out. And uh, today I have a special guest joining me for the first time on the podcast, and it's been a long time coming, getting him on the uh show here and i want to welcome jesse perry howdy howdy this resident star trek guru uh yeah uh, unhealthy fanatic <laughs> something like that i love it that's awesome so this is a totally star trek episode and we're going to start first talking about our favorite star trek series then we're going to talk about our favorite star trek movies and then we're going to get into our favorite episodes of every Star Trek that ever existed. <laughs> and The uh, whole catalog, all 500 and whatever episodes there are. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't count Discovery. Um, yeah, me Oh, snap. Okay. You, you, already, you beat me to it now. See, I was going to get into that. You know, You're going to get into you, that? Just, you stole my thunder. I stole your thunder. I'm yeah. sorry. No, it's okay. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'll start off since we're since you're the guest on the podcast. Can we go to my list first. Let's let's do your list of series first. From, okay. Uh, we're right. doing from best to worst. Yeah, or? best to worst. That's what I did. So, okay, yeah, that's, so that's what I did too. Okay. Absolute favorite, of course, Next Generation number one, and then I've got my second is the original series because that's those two were the ones that I watched when I was uh, really really into it when I was in high school, um, mm -hmm. which is you know so the original series Next Generation that's what I kind of grew up with. So those are my first two. Next Generation original okay. series. Uh, Deep Space Nine. I actually didn't even watch Deep Space Nine or Voyager until, gosh, I was... All right, so they were they were all being aired when I was in college. Wow. Uh, and so I didn't... Yeah, I just didn't yeah. watch those two until after I graduated college and I came back and then I rewatched, like, you know, binge-watched them. Mm -hmm. um, so Deep Space Nine will be my third, Voyager, and then Enterprise, fourth. Okay. And, you <laughs> you're know, not even. Nothing you're not even. Wait, is there something missing? Uh, there's nope. nothing. I guess that's all of the Star Trek. We series. haven't discovered what that <laughs> might be, and uh, I don't consider. You know, <laughs> yeah, I just don't consider Discovery Star Trek. So I just. All right. Put it on so me. we'll go. We'll go back and forth. I'll give you now my top series, and they're close to yours, uh, of course. And it's. I guess it's part of when you're born, but the next generation. I'm a Picard. You know, if I had to choose a captain. My role uh, model. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just such control of his emotions. Such a great actor, Patrick Stewart. Also Professor X. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, that was my number one. Now, number two might surprise some people. Um, mine is Voyager. I remember in, I think it started in 95, roughly. Yeah, something like that. And I, think I just yeah. remember each week when it came on TV... And I, I don't remember if it was CW or what was it on originally. I don't. Do you remember the network? I don't. Fox. Maybe it was Fox. It probably was Fox. So. And the, yeah. That, you know, Fox usually cancels things, but um, <laughs> thank God they didn't cancel it for a lot of years. Yeah. But Voyager, my number two, because what I liked about Voyager, it was something new every week. And yes, later on in the series, they did bring in the Borg and all, which I still love the Borg. and Sure. Everybody and, loves the Borg. You know, so. Or everybody loves to hate the Borg. <laughs> they love to hate the Borg. And, uh, but, uh, so. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm trying not, not to get yeah. too deep into it, but. Um, Voyager, I think, was the prettiest of the series. Well, I like the ship, too. I mean, I love, like. Voyager, the ship was a beautiful design. It, it was a beautiful design. Um, some things I have written in my notes here, a blade of armor. Mm -hmm. That was so cool. Right, yeah, yeah. You know, um, in, in the finale there. I was fascinated with the slipstream drive type of warp, those so, episodes. 
you know, and I was always pulling for him to get home. And of course, like I said, the, the Borg aspect, anytime the Borg were on there, I was, I was game to watch it. So yeah, that's my number two Voyager, uh, Deep Space Nine, I have to put it number three. I'm kind of like you. I wasn't a big Deep Space Nine fan until later. And my wife and I, we binge watch a lot of Deep Space Nine. And I get it looking back now, putting it in perspective. It came out in the 90s, and it was the darker version of Star Trek. Yeah, 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 early 90s. Was, so yeah, they, the first season aired, I think, during season seven of Next um, Generation. Next Generation, because yeah. they had when Picard was on there. And, yeah, yeah, it was and, crossover. And it was very interesting how they set up the uh, Cisco, how him and Picard, he didn't really like Picard because of, you know, he blamed Lekitis, him for the death, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. of his wife. Right. Right. And, um, yeah, by the way, if I, if I, if I get my facts wrong or something, please correct uh, me. Yeah, so. man, I'll step in there. Because I, I, I know I, you're, you're, I'm, I'm more Star Wars than Trek, but I'm still a, a, a Trekkie, Trekker. I don't know. I prefer Trekker. I don't care. Yeah, Trekker. Absolutely. Trekker. Trekkie sounds a little. Trekkie was, I think, the first term. First term, yeah. And it was that people came up with, and it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of a little bit dismissive, I think. Yeah, yeah and, and I definitely like encourage our listeners to um, respond to us on Twitter at Geek Home World. And when this makes it to the YouTube page, we've got some more stuff planned. Um, if you want, I know we've got some Star Trek followers on there. So I would love to hear your opinions about things, whether you disagree or agree. But anyway, so that was number three, Deep Space Nine. Um one thing I kind of didn't like, it was stationary. I'm used to being in a, a really cool starship, going mm-hmm. somewhere, or seeing something I've never seen, kind of like Roddenberry, you know, and, and the mantra of, you know, going where no no man or no one has gone before. Right. And, uh, but I, I grew to love it, and um, it got better, I think, once they got really got into the Dominion War and, you know, some... Really? Some, for me, I, yeah. I thought, you know, and towards the end, of course, the finale where they're showing the little montage and they don't show Jadzia Dax in there mm-hmm. really upset me because, and I can't think of the Esri. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They showed her, but they didn't show Jadzia with right. Worf. And I'm like, eh, okay, you're forgetting something. <laughs> but, uh, number four, the contractual is, obligations prevented her from appearing. <laughs> did it? Right. Okay. Yeah. I figured it probably so was something like, like that, that yeah. but I was like, uh, you have to have a picture of her on the nightstand, something, you know, something yeah, somewhere, right. you know, just, just a flash of her face somewhere. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Just, I don't know. Cause that's how important she was to Worf. Um, or he old man, right? Yeah. <laughs> as, as Cisco would say. Right. Um, number four is the next generation. No, 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 it's not. It's the original <laughs> series. I already said that. How dare you? Uh, I know some great <laughs> episodes and so iconic. I mean, it's 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 the Big Bang, mm-hmm. no pun intended, that you know kicked it all off. And if it wasn't for the original crew, we have none of this. So you know, um, number five is Enterprise. And I remember watching a good portion of Enterprise, and there were things I liked about it. I, I kind of liked the there were Suleiman. some good episodes. There were some good episodes, of, but it's so weird when me and my, my wife had not seen it first run like I did, and we were painfully trying to get through some of the first episodes. They were just so slow paced. Mm. I mean, just you know, watching them later. It's a bit too self aware to. Like, yeah. It, so here we are in space, and we're going to take a call from the kids back on Earth. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Remember that episode? And, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's it, so cringy. And, <laughs> yeah. And it's like, I uh, I think later they had like the Archer Maneuver mentioned in one of the films <laughs> or something, and, you know, uh-huh. and that's cool and everything, but I just, I'll put it in the words of Michael Dorn, who played Worf. He said Star Trek. When it came out, he says Star Trek has never went worked going back. It's always worked looking forward, and I th- think that's kind of how Enterprise Absolutely. was. Absolutely, I didn't know he said that. I'm gonna have to look that up now. <laughs> yeah, I remember it's that. been a Thank while you. since I, I've heard that quote by him. I, I read that somewhere at the time, and I guess we had internet back then. Awesome. Who knows? But you know, he wasn't. I wouldn't say that he was a hater of the show, but. When there was some talk about the show, he had, he had um, said I'd read somewhere that he had said that, and so 
I kind of feel the same way too. Now there were some interesting episodes like when they found the Borg in the Arctic, you know, that episode was interesting. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta bring the Borg into it, don't they? Yeah, yeah. You know, and everybody and after a while, you know, okay, here's the Borg. You know, it's kinda of like generations and oh no, excuse me, first contact was the first really to destroy the fact that the Borg, what made them so menacing when we first saw them in Next Generation was the fact that they had no leader. There was a, a collective mind, and then, you know, you have the Borg Queen, and then later on, you know, even though I love First Contact, and, and that's a movie, like the sequence when perhaps today is a good day to die and then mm -hmm. prepare for ramming speed and then <laughs> and then oh, sir there's another starship coming in i remember on my little car in my car stereo i used to turn i was able to put that somehow copy that off of tv uh don't cop um uh, legally copy things people um uh, but you know, it was up for my personal use and i'd put it on my car and i i guess i had it on a dvd or cd back then and i would like crank it all the way up and i had a little um, I think I had like a little DVD player. So I would play that sequence over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I would like crank it up when the starship comes in there. I get goosebumps, you know, when the Enterprise comes in. He's like, it's the Enterprise. And then First there's contact. Oh, and, God. I had so yeah. many, like, what you're talking about, like little snippets. Like, it started off with action. Ah. And yeah, and, you know, um, the whole speech, you know, I, I had the first probably 10 or 15 minutes of that movie until they go down to the planet. I have all of that like memorized. I could, I could repeat it now. But Mr. Hawk, pursuit course. Yes. You know, uh, engage, just, yeah. <laughs> you know, and as I can hear them. <laughs> right. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, you do remember how to fire phasers. There's so much, you know, it still had the humor and then, Oh, we'll talk about first contact later, but okay. But um, yeah, yeah, you're getting into the movies. I know now. I'm getting into the movies. I can't help it. But um, well, go ahead. And why don't you go ahead? Well, I, I will. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> I sorry. I guess I have sorry. to. No, you're no. I'm sorry. That's but but the one last thing is <laughs> I'm getting, I I'm say getting about, excited here. Yeah, yeah, yeah I am too. <laughs> um, was the rewriting of Star Trek history? I, I had a problem with that. Now it was interesting on Enterprise how. They had to deal with the Klingons basically having the humans on a leash and saying, you're not ready yet. And they were kind of like our benevolent the overlords. What did I say? Klingons. Oh, dear. I meant. I just want to make sure I was on the same page. No, no, no. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was an alternate timeline. That's my right. discovery. Oh, <laughs> Ooh. Wait. That, okay. We're I said a curse word. <laughs> no, no. We're going to have to talk about that, though. Okay, we, anyway, we can. We can. Get, getting ahead of whenever, ourselves. Whenever, whenever that's No, it's appropriate. not ready yet. We have to talk about, yeah. Okay. Not, so but go don't back forget to, that uh, thought just injected. I won't. No, don't worry. I've got it in my notes. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm going to rant. You got to keep me going. Yeah, I know you do. Um, <laughs> so back and, to the Vulcans and Enterprise. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I get some of that. And, you know, the Trip used to get on my nerves. I like Trip, but he got on my nerves. And I did like... Vulcan, uh, resident Vulcan. Oh Lord, what's her name? To Paul. To Paul. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, I like the characters on there. I just, all in all, as a series, it only went I think four seasons, four seasons. and 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 I'm surprised it kind of got that far. After a while, it just you know some of the stuff on rewatch which just 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 doesn't hold up as well mm -hmm. for me, and all that. Um, and um. Can I talk about Discovery? Because that would be the worst. Sure. Okay. Um, I've actually got, I mean, if you want to save that for a little bit later, because I was going okay. to, you know, we, when we, we talk can. about Roddenberry's vision of, you know, the okay. original, you know, I was going to compare that to Discovery and really get deep into my okay. opinions Okay, well, we'll do that then. Okay, So cool. we've covered Great. the series. Our, yeah, our, so let's our, talk about the movies. Okay, movies. Um, and since you started first, we'll start with your movies from best to... I won't say worst. I'll say not so good. Less, less, less least best. Least best. <laughs> least bestest. Right. Yeah. That, that'll work. Let's just mess it all, all right, up. All right. So I'm thinking I'm probably going to get a bunch of either odd looks from people or outright derision because the motion picture is my favorite Star Trek movie. Yep. See, I know exactly that. Oh you, gosh, I nobody, like nobody cheer. saw that. But it had, it's a good thing it I wasn't expression. drinking anything right then. I would have like choked. Yep. Exactly what I expected. Anyway, now the reason why I like the motion picture the best is because it's kind of the way I put it. It's like it's, it's more akin to pure cinema than the other Star Trek movies. You know, when the the motion picture didn't do as well 
monetarily as they right. wanted it to. Right. You know, then they went and hired um, <sighs> Brian Crap, uh, the Rathacon, who directed uh, Meyer, yeah, Nick Meyer. So Nicholas you know, Meyer. and went very much more. Um, you know, more exciting and just, you know, your standard, you know, hero, villain, you know, it was much more of a, I don't, I don't know how to put it, you know, kind of like a hero's journey type thing, mm-hmm. you know. So, you know, which was tons of fun. I love the Wrath of Khan, just like everybody does. It's great. Well, that's that's what you're supposed to, as a Star Trek fan, sure, go to as, as, as the number one film. And it, and it is awesome. We saw it recently, again, in the theater when they re- showed it. And, and I got I got a better appreciation for it. It's a fantastic um, film. And it is a fantastic film. And Ricardo Montalbán, oh, I mean, yeah. he Heck is yeah. Kirk. There is no <laughs> other Kirk other than him. Con. You're just, it, what did I say? Kirk. I said, you said Kirk. Good God, Lord. Kirk. I'm thinking Kirk and Con, you know, because, wow. Let's well, start with K. So. I should have had more coffee. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing unsweetened tea, so that's probably why okay. my memory's gone. But, um, yeah, there's... Oh gosh! Um, no, it's okay. Continue. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not going to be that. All right, I'll, I'll, I need to be less of a stickler. So, <laughs> no, no, you, that's my you fault. Be what you are, and uh, so your number one was the motion picture. Uh, yeah. Now, had you heard about? Um, in I think it would have been the comics or the gra- maybe the graphic novels or whatever that came later on. Um, and I don't know if that's still considered canon, but they said the V'ger probe mm-hmm. um, right. was actually a Borg probe. They kind of retroactively wrote that in <laughs> as a Borg probe. I mean, that's oh, sorry, really I'm reaching. Laughing. Yeah, but because it has to be the Borg. That would oh, make yeah, Borg. it has to be the Borg. <laughs> you know, but for me, that would really connect the dot. That's doing some George Lucas stuff right here. That's like real, but that's really reaching back yeah. to try to change history and rewrite history. You know, I'm not familiar with all that, that whole storyline. You, uh, know, you know, my friend, Anthony, he's knows all about it. And, and, gotcha. um, he knows a lot of, just like the star Wars, the extended, um, Oh Lord, what do you call extended it? Universe. Uh, expanded universe, expanded yeah, universe. yeah, all the yeah. books. There he has go. like all the books, and he knows right. which a lot of that isn't canon anymore, which is sure. just wrong. You know, I uh, never got into Star Trek novels. You know? Yeah, well, uh, you know, he, he even liked the cartoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's I love good. the Star Trek cartoon you know. too. But okay, continue. Let's continue yeah. on. So um, motion right, pictures so yeah, number motion one pictures, for you. Yeah, because it's just cinematic, and it's just. You know, it's so pure Roddenberry Star I Trek that it's, you know, really heavy handed and I really obnoxious. think though <laughs> it's in dire need of like digital restoration. I'm sure it's been done. It has been, yeah. Yeah, but I, I feel like it yeah, maybe it needs you a know what? you know yeah, you they need a four K H D R version that of That would be and, and put it in theaters. I'll yet. I'll go see it, you know, and, and I don't okay. dislike Dolby Vision. The, I'm there. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know, and <laughs> You know, put it in an IMAX or something. Well, I don't know if that, if that would do it justice, but you know, I think, and it's a product of its time. Seven is it seventy nine? Yeah, seventy nine. Seventy nine. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there had been X amount of years since you know with no Star Trek, and then they came out with that, and right. so people probably had ideas of what they were expecting. So, you know. And it was a different time. There was no social media, so they didn't totally like obliterate the film and and the director and the producer and the writer and all because they didn't like the way it went. Yeah. But okay, what else do you have for us? All right, here's another one that's going to get weird looks. But my okay, second holding on favorite, to something. my oh, second favorite brace for impact oh, sorry. is insurrection. I just love insurrection. I know. I know. Everybody's insurrection like, oh, to God, me dude. plays like. I love Insurrection, but it plays like an episode of The Next Generation for me. Which is probably why I like it so much. (laughs) Which, yeah, there's, and we were we were talking before we started recording. We're um, we sort of compared lists, but not really. And that's we were saying there's there's hardly any episode of Next Generation we don't like. You know, it's it's, we'd have to think really hard of an episode that we didn't like. Um, But okay, Um, anything else you want to say about that? Um, insur- why? Because you why why number two? Why is it better than Khan? Wrath of Khan? Why uh, is it? <laughs> yeah, you know what? I didn't do a whole lot of thinking about this ahead of time. So just off the cuff, I like the fact that um, I don't know. It seemed like the characters 
you know, there's a moral high ground, right? So you had yeah. this planet. There's a admiral who's going to use the planet for the Federation's benefit against the Federation's morals, right? Stated morals, and you know Picard has to step in and take that more high road. So I guess that's kind of why I like it so much because Picard's doing what Picard does best. You know, he steps in, he deals with a really sticky moral situation, and does the right thing and shows everybody. And the, they're basically uh, the to, same children of those people and. I forgot who his Picard's love interest was, but she did a wonderful job of acting. The character's name was Anish, and I'm trying to remember the, na- the actor's name. I can see her face. I don't, Donna something. I know I should probably have all the information in front of me, but yeah. but she did a wonderful job, and she was just so yeah. relaxing and just, you know, it's, it was, it's a good movie. It's a good Star Trek movie. It's mm-hmm. not near the top of my list, but... No, most people but, don't. Okay, you, I, I like that you're surprising yeah. me here. So yeah, all right. So moving on, we got first contact will be next. Okay, which is, well, which I'll yeah, re- yeah, that's just totally first contact. Jonathan Frakes directed it. Yeah, you know he, and I know he's, he's got the Borg. Yeah, it's it, got James Cromwell. Yes, who I, I met in Savannah, by the way. Wow. Yeah. What was that like? That was awesome. He's just, he's a he's a he's a really passionate person, uh, and he you know he took time to talk to me for like ten minutes or so, you know, just chatting. He's really tall. Yeah, and something. And since you mentioned that, I should have mentioned this at the top of the show. Jesse Perry, he's been on my radio show, which is also on YouTube, Savannah on Film. So if you want to check that out, check it out on Facebook. Um, you can listen to the interview on the Savannah on Film YouTube channel. So he did a great job with that. And and so yeah, you're you're a local filmmaker. Just yeah, that's where give I that, give that's that. where I met Cromwell. It was at the Savannah Film Festival. Gosh, what five years ago or something. Yeah, just give a quick bio of just what you are. What are you, a producer? You're a writer? Uh, yeah. Director? <laughs> okay. Seriously, I mean, you know, it's... And among other things, so he, he knows... Polymath. He knows... Uh, you like math? Uh, no, I said a polymath. Oh. A, a renaissance man, if oh. you will. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. To be very pretentious. Okay. Um, do you want to expand on that real quick, or...? Well, I mean, yeah, I just mean, like, you know... Yeah, well... I, you know, I don't come from, you know, knowing anybody in the film industry or having mm-hmm. any friends or, you know, anything like that, <laughs> any kind of connection the... to the, well, until I went to GFA, I, you know, yeah, Georgia film really, I, you know, that's where I, Ed and I, right, I right. kind of met each other. Yep. What I'm saying is before that, you know, I had no connections with it. So I just kind of had to do everything myself. So I had to kind of learn how to do everything myself. So right. I, you know, I produce direct, right cinematographer and edit you know so can we mention that film in your series or yeah sure i mean we're kind of getting off star trek though but okay I, mean, yeah, I, know, be, well, well, I just want to put that in there you did you did a film that i was part of uh recording right. sound for called the construct, the construct and um it deals with post-humanism thank you and um you wrote that you directed it as part of your horizon series right okay yeah thank you so you're, you're awesome so, well, no, you are awesome, and um, I. Now, sometimes I wonder if I'm communicating it very well, but yeah, it's okay. it's a series. There's there's four um, short films, so uh, that's number three. One and two we're in the process of making okay. now. I hopefully, have them done by October. Where can um, some of the listeners go to to see Construct? Is uh, my Vimeo channel, so it's Vimeo dot com slash Post Human Collective, all okay. one word. Okay, Post Human Collective on Vimeo there. So yeah. check it out. And uh, on this show, I can do a call to action. So I'm telling my audience, go check it out, okay? Sweet. Um, so back to Star Trek. So there was our yeah. com- there was part of the intro right. I should have so put in there. I'm sorry. After First Contact, uh, I've got Generations. This is number what on your number list? Number four would be Generations. Generation. I, I love that. Guinan. Yeah, just because it was like the transitional one, you know. Yeah, two captains. I mean, how could you go wrong, you know, and there's always been the Kirk versus Picard, and they have to work together. And, oh gosh, his name That's escapes me, Soren. Mm-hmm. Who, who, what's his name? Um, Malcolm McDowell. Did a tremendous job. Time is the fire in which <laughs> we burn. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I have so many, you know... Um, the, the the speech that Kirk, when they're sitting on the horses there, him and Picard, and, and Picard's trying to get him to come back out of the Nexus, and he's like, 
Don't let him ever promote you. Don't let him do anything that, that takes straight, you out of that yeah. captain's chair. Because while you're there, got goosebumps just then. you make a difference. Yeah, and, and, and that gave me goosebumps. And I'm like, yes. And Kirk gets his own little fight scene there. And, of course, he dies in that one. Which kind of, yeah. I, know. I know. I kind of messed yeah. with it continuity a little bit. Blah, blah, blah. But uh, I love the part in the beginning where he's like, uh, was it? Was it? Was that the one with Scotty? And he's he's like, sir, is there something? Was Scotty in that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he goes, when sir, is there something wrong with your chair when right. they're on the, they're on is the, it Enterprise, the Enterprise B? B? Yep. Correct? Okay. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, there's so many good things about Generations. And it's definitely, it's it's higher up on my list. But, but yeah. Um, go ahead. The, right, yeah, yeah, so then I got the Wrath of Khan, which, you know, I know people would argue that it should be higher on the list. It's awesome. I love it. It's yeah. great. It's fantastic. The bug no still in the ear still freaks me out. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I just weird yeah. about bugs and everything, and that that has always freaked me out. But yeah. it is a brilliant movie, and and Khan is just so oh my gosh, you know, sure, it absolutely. is a great Star Trek. It's not my favorite though. It's mm. but I do enjoy it, and I, and ugh. They're probably calling us millennials. We're not millennials, but <laughs> they wouldn't get. No. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know where that I'm keeps. Probably from. Gen X, man. Come on. Yeah, we're Gen X. Yeah, we're the MTV generation. Yeah. Remember when they played music videos when they existed? <laughs> so yeah, after that, all right. So now the next three, I kind of clump them together because I don't. I don't know. I can't really put them in order. But uh, the Final Frontier, Undiscovered Country, and the Voyage Home, to me, those are all good. You know, great. I like watching them and stuff. But they're, you know, they're just kind of meh. I think. Most Star Trek people say you have to like Wrath of Khan has to be your favorite, which I, I disagree, you know. Um, but they say that um, you have to hate the final frontier, hate the final frontier. Yeah, I don't hate it, I think it's cool. I think it's okay. And I, and if I'm <laughs> correct, I think William Shatner directed it. Uh, yes, that's yeah, um, yes, that's one he directed. The, the yep. Shat did yep. that. And <laughs> what does God need with a starship? Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's and it has its moments with Cybok, which is mm. his was a half brother. Spock's half brother. That's what people most have a problem with with the movie of Cybok. Yeah, yeah. And I get the idea of what they were going for, but it works if you don't think too hard about it. You know, I Just guess you take know. Take a step back. Just I can chill, still <laughs> enjoy your popcorn. I've, yeah, I can still, and it's still... It's very Star trek Yeah, it's still that original generation, and they had the better movies. They're always going to probably have the better movies. But um, send your comments to at Geek Home World on Twitter <laughs> or on our YouTube channel, yeah. Geek Home World. So Nemesis was my next one. Okay, what number are we at in the, in the list, this or did is, you number Well, them? I messed up the numbering because I clumped okay. those three together. But, okay. So we're you know, this is like number six or seven, eight, something like that. Um, okay, well, Voyage... Next to last. Let's put it that way. Nemesis is my next to last. Okay. Can we talk about Voyage Home real quick? Cause sure. you, yeah. Which ones did you lump together? Uh, Voyage Home, Undiscovered Country, and Final Frontier. Voyage... Okay, Voyage Home we talked about. Everybody loves a Voyage Home. Yeah. It's a great Yeah, it, it looks very dated. <laughs> if you watch it it's now, very it's, very, 80s. it's yeah. very 80s. It's very 80s. And But it's still... It's basically a Save the Whales campaign. Yeah. That's a right. friend of mine... Anthony said, and he's he's true uh, about it, but um, it's, it's still fun. It's still yeah. fun. Nuclear and, vessels. Um, yeah. <laughs> the nuclear <laughs> vessels. Vessels. <laughs> and, uh, that, cop, that cop's expression has always killed me. Yeah. My actor was, but he was great. It feels very kind of 80s. Like it was, you could tell it was made in the 80s. It just feels of the 80s, and that works. That's what they were going for. And and um, gosh, what was the other one? My brain is scattered of the three you clumped together. Uh, Undiscovered Country. Undiscovered which Country. Which is pretty cool. Which I love Shakespeare so naturally. Yeah. I would love Undiscovered Country. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay, okay. so the, your next one was n- Nemesis. Is mm-hmm. that correct? Nemesis was my second to last. I think that it's a shame that they didn't keep going after Nemesis, make another next generation movie. It was a good send off, uh, but I. I liked it yes. more than people give it credit. I really do. Yeah. You know, I uh, I don't think Shenzon really looked like Picard, but I think they did the best they could finding you a younger body double. Man, I thought he looked. Yeah, I yeah, don't think I he looked totally as like see him looking like. I guess it's because they shaved. Uh, I'm sorry, the actor uh, was that Tom Hardy. Yes, Tom Hardy. Which they you know that blows my mind when I think you know. Oh my God, that was Tom Hardy. That's yeah, that's, he looks so young. That's Bane. It's got the draconine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can't do the voice, no. but um, 
Yeah, Tom yeah. Hardy's so awesome. It's gonna be awesome in Venom. Uh, anyway, okay. So Nemesis, what did you like about Nemesis? I mean, well, I mean, it was the the visual effects were just unbelievable. Um, Story wise, I just what about uh, but, the scimitar and how dang big that ship was in comparison? Do you think that's realistic? Per se, well, Ed. You know, <laughs> am I am I thinking too hard on or too much no, no, into no, yeah, it? Yeah, we can get into the science and stuff, I guess. But it's like you know, there's so many liberties taken with that. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's really artistic license. But you know, hypothetically, you really don't have a size limitation on what you know. It's true, and it's space, so the yeah, aerodynamics as long as you don't matter. try to land it on a planet. That's you know, why the board it can, can be whatever size you want it to be. You can have a cube, a diamond, um, right? You know, whatever you're in. Yeah, no aerodynamics to worry about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know the worst or most impossible thing to profession to have in the Star Trek universe is selling insurance for the Enterprise because <laughs> they love yeah, to crash right. their ships. Yeah, no, in the movies, at least. Oh, God. Blow up <laughs> the damn ship, Picard. Yeah, every single movie. Oh, <laughs> every other yeah. movie, at least. Yeah, I know. Oh, we're crashing the Enterprise again. Oh, I guess it's time for an upgrade. Oh, we're back for the next, you know, got a new ship next time. Got a new uh, ship, the Enterprise Z.1. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right, so what's in... Is there right, last one is Search for Spock. That's kind of my least favorite Star Trek film. Mm, some people would, you know, almost put that right next, obviously, two and three, con, and they would kind of put those together because they, they, right. there's a continuity to it, yeah. you know. But just imagine if they were creative enough to do maybe, well, they couldn't have done the Voyage Home. They couldn't have done any other ones. But wouldn't it have been cool if they waited a couple movies? I, I, they couldn't have, I don't think, at the time. You know, you kind of go with the momentum of it. And the Genesis whole idea is, is a great idea. And, mm -hmm. and um, I think Kirk lost his son in that one. Yeah. Yeah, so it is a powerful movie. But Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's really dramatic. And, you know, I don't know, the whole thing about Nimoy is out and now he's back in so I was writing my new movie you know type thing it's kind of like a, I don't know it's kind of yeah. it was almost like they were trying to play let's fix it you know and yeah <laughs> let's let's fix it fix a hole you know which um, you know um, uh, crap I'm drawing a blank now who played Krug Christopher Plummer uh, Christopher um, Chris, um, <laughs> man I don't know I should have looked at that I'm ashamed now I am too I'm, I've just lost my Greek credibility is it Christopher no. Geek credibility no no Christopher Plummer was um, <laughs> not Plummer not uh, Plummer um, Chris we're talking about Doc Brown Christopher Lloyd thank you Christopher Lloyd oh gosh because oh uh, yeah he was Krug but, sorry Mr. Lloyd yeah but um, I'm trying to think in in um, Undiscovered Country that was um Oh, that was Christopher Plummer, yes. That was Christopher Plummer. <laughs> right. That's where I'm getting confused. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a Christopher thing we wouldn't right. understand. Yeah. So, cool. It's interesting, yeah. Huh. I, mean, I never thought of that. I just literally put that, that must together. must have been in the back of my brain, I guess. Yeah. That's why I said Plummer. So. Cool. That's my excuse, anyway. <laughs> That's a good excuse. It works for me. Cool. All right, what's next on your list? Uh, did you want to do favorite episodes or? Oh, okay, so you're done with the movies. Oh wow. Yeah, that's. Oh, we didn't get your movies though. You got no, no, no. You, but you know, there's other ones, so you're, you're not you're not even including. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh damn. I have oh. no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> okay. There is no more Star Trek than what we've just discussed. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I'm oh, you're gonna... talking about that other thing that there's. Yeah. No, that, that's well. I mean, it ha we'll get say into Star Trek, but it's well, not Star I'll let Trek, you. What, what did you call it? What's that? What did you call it? That term that i loved oh jj trek jj trek yeah <laughs> hashtag jj trek there's actually a couple of other names there's the kelvin timeline and yeah. but uh, we'll get into that we'll get into that yeah. um let, let's just jump into my movies and i'm gonna mention those jj treks in my list cool. so number one is no <laughs> they're fun th movies they're you'll fun throw, you'll throw your coffee they're, at me if i say that no no they're yeah. they're beautiful they look gorgeous they're fun movies but they're not star trek i love patrick stewart and anything he does and i agree for my number one movie it is not con it is first contact i remember that movie coming out i can quote that movie i can sit down and watch that movie from beginning to end and still love everything about it can i interrupt you i know this sure, is your, i don't mean to jump in on because this no, is no, your no. list of your favorite films but i really have to throw something in here sure that sure i want you to riff off of maybe if you want sure to. sure uh, yeah. like, okay, so when I, when I saw First Contact, I saw I actually was in college, but I came home for Christmas, and it was showing in the theater. 
down here on Abercorn, which is now a car dealership. Oh, wow. Yeah, so okay. this is like way back in the day. That's way back in the day. 96, right, was when that was in the theater. Right. So anyway, so I came home for Christmas. I went by myself. Nobody with me, just by myself, went to the theater and saw First Contact. The scene where Picard, uh, where uh, Lily confronts Picard in his ready room when he's telling him we're going to hold the ship, we're not going to, we're not going right. to self-destruct and blow up the, another Enterprise. The line <laughs> must be drawn here, no further. That scene absolutely just gives Powerful. me chill bumps every time I see it. I'm not being like fanboyish. So, I mean, so Captain Ahab has to kill his whale. His performance is yeah, absolutely, absolutely just Spot wow. I, you never saw that from Picard, the character. And before. on the flip side, in Generations, I loved when, well, I didn't love it, but when he finds out there were, not is it Robert is his That's his brother. That's his brother, but mm-hmm. I cannot think of the of the son. But uh, that touching moment I'll think of it in a second. where where um Counselor Troy Renee, Renee, Renee and, and and it's and it's beautifully shot. There's like this kind of glimmer kind of to the book that he's the photo album he's looking at Picard is and he just yeah. breaks down because he's always been that's the first time we saw Picard really break down to that extent. Yeah. And and it's such a beautiful moment in in generations, and you know you're dealing with the nexus and everything, and he goes there and he has the perfect family and all that. Mm. But that's showing the range of an actor that Patrick Stewart is, and and just as he was great in First Contact with that, he was great with the emotional side in Generations for me. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I totally yeah. agree with you on that. The part like and where he just loses his stuff and he just destroys his little ship. The and, line must be drawn here. No further. Uh, <laughs> they invade our our <laughs> space. We fall we back. Fall back. And, yeah, he just I mean, you know how he kind of like it was I mean he did the actor thing. And he's like, no, he like, and he just like turns around and just with with his uh, not laser sword. This isn't Star Wars. It's uh, uh, phaser. Phaser, a phaser. Phaser, and, and he like knocks the ship down. You know, he just kind of loses control of his emotions. We see a little bit of that in Next Generation after he's assimilated by the Borg. Yeah, and, but I mean, the performance yeah. itself, like you're talking, is very calculated because you know he starts out very quiet and it's like very right. You know, it's not just oh well. Oh, I'm these go were the days. Now. No computers. No, you know, when they're on the holodeck in the ship and all that. And I remember watching that with my dad. He he didn't really like science fiction and all that, but he liked the part on the boat. You know, and and and, 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 and so that was kind of cool. You know, on the ship. Yep. All right. So yeah, what's your second one? Uh, second one is I almost said episode, but it's a Star Trek Six: The Undiscovered Country. I love Shakespeare, so it's so quotable to me. It's action-filled, and it's dealing with basically the Cold War, which it seems like we might be going back to the Cold War. I don't know. But um, I just there were just so many, so many parts of it. And um, I, I mean, I could just talk about just like everything that I loved about that movie. And that's a movie I can watch over and over again, and I can quote it and and usually movies that I like so much, I have quotes from them, and and, and I use them in everyday life <laughs> because mm-hmm. I love love them so much. But that's my number two to undiscovered country. Number three, I put this probably higher on the list, and and and, and I've been going back and forth with my list. But uh, Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan. It is, I think, because of the importance of the film. It is a great film, Ricardo Montalban. I hope I'm saying that right. Mm-hmm. It was the definitive Kirk, you know, later on when we get to see Benedict Cumberbatch, who is a brilliant, brilliant actor. Mm -hmm. He, he does a great job in that film. I'm going to get to the Star Trek film, but he's not Khan. And my wife said that too. And I agree with her on that. You know, he's a great villain, but he's not Khan. Mm -hmm. And, um, anyway, so number two is, uh, Star Trek six, the undiscovered country number. Oh, excuse me. Number three, Okay, that was number two. Number three was The Wrath of Khan, Star Trek Two. Now, Generations is my fourth from the top there. And two Enterprise captains, like I said, how could you go wrong? Uh, Picard just shows, I was just talking about the great depth of emotion that he has and that. So, I mean, there's so many great things. Guyne and I love Whoopi Goldberg's Absolutely. character in that. And um, She's like new, the Yoda of the Star Trek universe. She really kind of is. And... Um, so so important um 
such an important character. I don't think I appreciated Guinan enough till later on, you know, how good she was, but, um, and the villain Soren, I mean, you get why he's doing what he's doing. It's very much Thanos to me in a way. Mm -hmm. It's just the way he's going about it Mm -hmm. is just, um, not a good way. You know, um, there's so many technical things like the stellar to talk, Cartography. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I almost said topography. That's probably something else. But um, him and Data and Data's got the emotion chip, and it's he's trying to get adjusted to having that emotion chip yeah. that fused to his neural net. So there's he's going through all these emotions he's never felt before, and um, he's trying to, you know. And I think Picard says something to the fact that fear can be an emotion. Or, right. you know, yeah. I forgot how he said it, but there's so many good things about Generations. I, I loved it. In the Nexus, it's so the parts of the Nexus are just so beautifully shot. That movie is just beautiful. The cinematography, I think, is, it's be- a beautiful movie. Mm-hmm. And it's very heartwarming and tragic. And it just, for me, it has a lot of everything. So my fifth from the from this top spot there is Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. I... I think having Spock back and, you know, losing Kirk's son, it's such an important movie. And I feel like it kind of has to be higher up on, on, on my list of favorites. Cause I did enjoy it. I like the idea of the Genesis device and it, you know, later on the fact that Kirk's son gets killed and plays into the undiscovered country where he's like, you know, I Spock personally vouching for me. You will. vouched for me. <laughs> you know, he's like, right. they're 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 going to die. Let them die. You know, and, and it, it the undiscovered country deals with like prejudice against people and and, and different trait. things and 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 that Cold War mentality too. And and then finding that undiscovered country, which is peace. You know, and Chancellor Gorkon. But but search for Spock. You know, lays some of the groundwork for that. Um, my next one is uh, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. And like I said earlier, it's basically a Save the Whales commercial, but it's a fun movie. and it's Yeah, it was a great movie. Yeah. Um, then There's a next, lot of character development in that one. There, there is. Um, I love the time travel aspect of it. It was just fun. Um, Insurrection is my next one. Um, and like I said, it played more like an episode than a movie. But it, I did enjoy it. You know, next on my list is Nemesis, which I think is underrated. And um, Shinzon's not a great villain, but I think he's a pretty good villain. And there's, and seeing Troy and them, you know, the marriage ceremony, you know, they didn't do the full Beta Z (laughs) wedding. Hey, it's like, I'm I'm going to the. I never noticed that. You know what? Yeah, because. What the heck? Because we didn't get our Beta Zoid wedding, all, all the PG. new. It was probably in their contracts, the writer in their contracts. But yeah. um, <laughs> so. Well, um, when Quentin Tarantino does his R rated movie, maybe we'll see a Beta Zoid wedding. I'm a little scared <clears throat> of Tarantino <laughs> touching track at this point, but I don't know. He may do something interesting, but I just hope it's. Uh, oh, I don't know. I'm sorry. Is. I got ahead of ourselves. I, I know. I know. My bad. But, um, That's my fault. <laughs> Nemesis, you know. It's got its faults, but it's a beautiful movie. And and before I like that character, that was my update. least favorite part of the whole movie was I it was like you killed Data. No, it's not okay with me. <laughs> yeah, it's not okay. Fine, but before, but Data, lit, but they made yeah, sure so before I, will become it. Data. I know <laughs> Data by proxy, kind of. It's kind of like. Do you remember there's like a voyage, uh, a Voyager episode where the like the entire crew gets killed, but then they get replaced by the, their own counterparts from a different universe. Yeah, and I was like, what the no. Yeah. Not nah, okay. Sometimes they're reaching. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta you gotta crank out a storyline, especially yeah, a weekly it's like series. Like a Rick and Morty episode like. or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, Okay, now we're going to get into territory that you don't uh, particularly recognize as canon. Um, well, I thought we were going to talk about Roddenberry's Star Trek first, right? Okay, well, so well I'm just going down my list. Okay. I was going to continue my list, and then we can... Yeah, what you got? Which I have to go in the JJ track now. Okay. Okay. Um, I think arguably the best of the JJ track trilogy... Oh, you're, I'm sorry. You're still on your movie list. My yeah. Bad. I'm sorry. ...is Star Trek Beyond. <laughs> 
and you you could just sit over there in the corner and grunt. And I like that one the most out of the three. I do too. Yeah. I hate it. Of course, when we first, my wife and I, when we first saw the trailer and they had sabotaged by Beastie Boys, I'm like, what? <laughs> the hell is this whenever this i heard justin nuts. lynn i was like oh, oh god, god fast and please furious please track it stop you know and and um but in the context of the movie <laughs> it worked but you know there was things you know we've got we're on the five-year mission or whatever and and kirk's just all um, just whatever and bones is trying to bring him up on his birthday and you know try to give him a pep talk and different things and of course, we destroy the heck out of the Enterprise, you know. Mm-hmm. It's, you know. Um, so then, um, next, which would be number 10 on my list, would be j- some more J.J. Trek, the orig- the, his original Star Trek. And I the think 2009 the, one? Yeah. Okay. Um, um, I just think Star it, Trek. Just Star Trek, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, he did a decent job of establishing the reboot and kind of alternate universe and having Spock in there. Now, later on, possibly beyond that, they were going to bring in Kirk. There were the rumors that they should have. They should have, but nobody actually made that, you know, olive branch or that whatever to William Shatner. Well, Shatner, I think, was willing to do it. What I heard was that the fear was, J.J. Abrams says, like, well, if we bring Shatner in, then it's going to be about Kirk. Right. And it's not going to be about recreating the Star Trek universe anymore. Right, and it'd be weird to have two Kirks, but, you know, um, I I love... I have no problem with Zachary Quinto as Spock, except, honestly, he was too human, you know? And yeah. they really focused on that, you know, and I'm probably getting some hate territory here, but... I'm sorry, I'm trying to withhold my... Uh... I, I know, okay. Um, <laughs> but go ahead. No, they please. did their best impressions, I think, of establishing the original characters, um, Scotty and, and, and all that, and, and Bones I probably liked the most, but, you know, his puns after a while, they, you know, went a little too far with. Mm. And, um, but it, you know, we have that. Then we have number 11 on my list, uh, a J.J. Trek film, Into Darkness. And like I said, I loved Cumberbatch, great villain. But this was what they did with Killmonger, basically, in Black Panther recently, like this year. They made the villain the hero of the story, which is flipping the script. You know, we had in this, he flipped the whole, was it Star Trek? It was not Wrath of Khan. It was Wrath of Khan, where, you know, we had the, you have always been and will be my best friend, and they flipped the script. You know, it was Spock on the outside of the glass instead of, which is very interesting. Right, right, right. Which is some Ryan Johnson stuff that they kind of did with <laughs> Last Jedi, and, you know, uh, ah, I don't yeah. I don't That's even want to get started there because I'm getting yes. upset. Right. Um, but uh, <laughs> but it, they totally justified Khan in this movie. I mean, he was totally justified. He was very much, like I said, Thanos. Mm. He was totally justified in what he did. Well, Thanos could have created more resources. So Justified or... I oh, mean, no, I think... I, I will strongly say this. Just I, understandable. The way they flipped it, I think that Khan in Into Darkness was justified in what he did. His means of how he went about it was wrong he was just protecting his people and there's nothing wrong with that but i think the way he went about it of course you know he'd kill anybody or anything kind of like thanos did to achieve that but for me i came out of that movie thinking okay kirk was kind of wrong you know (laughs) he should listen to (laughs) you know they totally switched the roles and for me i felt like khan was justified and and it was an interesting take on it but you know, I, I don't know. This is, um, this is the main one of the main problems I have with JJ uh, Trey. But yeah, yeah, okay. I got two more on here, and and then my list is complete um, for the movie. So number twelve on my list is Star Trek: The Motion Picture. I thought it was too dark and slowly paced, and that's kind of of the time it was made. We talked about that a little bit. Um, I don't know. Well. I don't really know much else to say about it. Um, That's fine. I mean, but, you know, yeah, I, people, I, I can respect I the fact that you... I think you kind of summed it up. That's yeah. what most people say is wrong with it. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, uh, 
I put the final frontier, which is Star Trek V, as the thirteenth film in the series of movies as the one everybody hates. Most gets the most hate. Yep. Gets the most hate. And and I thought it was kind of too bland. It feel it felt like filler to me. It felt like they needed, you know, to put out a movie and kind of felt that way. So yeah. anyway, that's that's my favorite to least favorite uh movies in the Star Trek universe. So, where do we want to go from there, sir? Want to talk about Roddenberry? Let's talk about Roddenberry. Which you know, I could go on. This is something I could like talk about forever. But let's okay. do it real quickly. So, I, sure. I, I kind of outline some of the things that I think kind of make up what Roddenberry's humanism is, because you know, I do read a lot of books that are like biographical on Roddenberry, just because that's kind of my thing. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, there was always a morality. In Star Trek, that was kind of like every episode of the original series, there was a moral, right? Right, right, right. Um, and it could be, uh, usually had to deal with um, overcoming human prejudices or, you know, since that was during the civil rights era, you had a lot of issues like, um, well, the, you know, gender issues or uh, civil rights. Was it or, Nicole Nichols, Ahura? Michelle Nichols. Mm-hmm. Michelle Nichols. Yeah, they changed it. Yeah. Your name's now Michelle. No, I'm joking. <laughs> when, when I mess something up, I say, oh, right. I, I remember. Yep, it. I remember. Yep. Um, but uh, her, you know, mm. seeing an African-American on a TV show. Female officer on the bridge. Yeah, female yeah. officer on the bridge. You know, you had the Russian officer. They had that. They had Who didn't arrive until the second season, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank Don't you. Know yeah. yeah. And, but, you know, you had a good dichotomy of people there. Um, what's the guy? Um, oh, my um, oh, uh, I guess yeah, I said that I would. Uh, <laughs> oh my, Sulu, uh, Sulu, um, Sulu, George Takei, George Takei. You yeah. know, having his character on there, and so that you know, it was very diverse cast, and 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 so ahead of its time, and 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 the humanism, um, the morality. Well, you're talking about the morality of it. Yeah, you're or? right there. I mean, that's exactly what I was saying. It's you know, it's always. Uh, first and foremost, um, but also progress. You know, it was that humans could make themselves better if well, they wanted to. Like, well, it's interesting. To... Later on, Picard, there was an episode where I think they had some people that were from like somewhere in the 20th century mm-hmm. on there, and they're like, one guy was like an oil baron or something, or a banker right. or something. Mm-hmm. And he's a like, banker. "Well, we've gotten rid of disease and famine and stuff like that, and we don't mm-hmm. go for material wealth anymore." And and uh, which is reiterated. And we've gotten rid of war, year. but they never really got rid of war because then it would be boring. They'd just be flipping well. Around what he meant was like there was nation states on Earth didn't fight anymore, meaning there was no war amongst humans over, oh, okay. over nation yeah. state okay. boundaries and so forth. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, and. Uh, we figured out our planet, but yeah, we couldn't control the rest of the universe. Which, well, you know, Klingons are going to be Klingons. You know, Kardashians you know, are going to be Klingons. <laughs> to quote from the um, Undiscovered Country, would be the alien uh, trash of the galaxy. And, mm, well, quote, you know, and oh, that's, that's some, yeah, that's a little bit. Uh, that's but, that's yeah, pretty right. pretty tough words there, you know. But yeah. it's important in the context of the Undiscovered Country when they say that because there's. Um, Chancellor Gorkon's daughter, I forgot her name, but um, in, undis- in Undiscovered Country, but she says, it, in, when he says inalienable human sapiens. rights, she said, the Only very club. sound of human is racist. And if you think that in a universe, a truly universal context, <laughs> it is, it, you know, us to uh, think, you know, we're the, the most dominant species in the galaxy and we're not <laughs> necessarily, you know. We, yeah. We're important, but we may, we're, you know, there are other species out there. I like my species the way it is, as we said, you know. <laughs> you know, so. you know I, I'm going to have to disagree with the current. All right. So this has to do with social justice warriors. Are you going to bring it, that up? Okay. Right. All right. Yeah. So it's, okay. You can say that if you want to. I mean, which, you know, I agree with most of that movement. Mm-hmm. You know, on the surface, but it's, I don't, there's, there's a problem uh, here. And what you're talking about, I, maybe that character, I'm trying to remember the name of Gorkin's daughter, too. Um, I can't think of her name. Anyway, right. that character may be a good, now that I think of it, um, kind of like a good archetype of that problem. 
you know, I mean, because the Federation wasn't a homo sapiens only club. She was being yeah, very, that's what she, said, yeah. she was being very judgmental herself uh, because. But later on, she said something to, you've restored my father's faith. True. And yeah, all that. So she had an arc that, yeah. where she learned, you know, I have a problem with some movies and we won't get into great detail about this because this could be a whole entire show and a lot of people talk about it. But I don't want characters in, in films that I watch because they're a male, because they're a female, because they're this or they're that. I want yeah. them in there because the story calls for them. And if it calls for them to be a male, a female, African-American, a person of color, a person... It's not of color. You know, I don't want to see every man in a movie now be the dumb character. You know, if, you know, it's lazy writing, you know, just to, it's, 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 it's elevating some, but when you elevate some people, you push other people down and you, you, you dumbify them or you make them scapegoats, you know, and there always has to be, a little bit of that going on in a, in a good story, but I don't like to see it shoved down our throats, kind of like it mm. was in Star Wars, The Last Jedi, and stuff like that. And like, and it's off the subject here, but like the character of Finn and Rose, their whole story arc in Last Jedi had no bearing to me on the film. They mm. they underused those characters. I didn't really care about Rose in that film at all. I didn't believe any of their storyline. She could be an interesting character. She you know, could she be. Could be she fascinating, could be. but there's no more development. Right. But for the overall of the film, they could have left that out and it would have right. made it a much leaner, better film, you know, and, it, and they underuse Finn and, um, and I don't ca- care about diversity. I love diversity, but don't do diversity just for diversity's sake. Do it because the story calls for it. And write more films that are diverse, that have more diversity, definitely. I want that. But, you know, you can't change overnight someone that is something forever. And then, I don't know, maybe you can, maybe you can. But I, I don't like when we're beat over the head with it, you know. Like like right. in, the, yeah. in the last <clears throat> um, J.J. Trek, um, Star Trek Beyond, we find out that is it Sulu? Um, oh, you mean the two gay characters? Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. he he was gay in there, right. which no, I have no problem with that. But here's the thing, it had no bearing on the storyline. I know it was like a throwaway. It felt like oh, they look. just said, "Okay, we'll make him a yeah. gay character." Even I, I want to say that George Takei <laughs> came out, it's kinda, no pun intended, and said, "You know, that's great, but I don't I don't see the purpose for that character." Right. You know, all of a sudden. Without any pretext, anything leading up to it. Discovery had the same problem, you know, with their two gay characters, their gay couple. It's uh-huh. like, because, and this is what uh, the article that uh, Gold wrote the article mm-hmm. on her problems with Discovery, uh, The Dismal Frontier, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, but yeah. Okay. Her I'm compl- sorry. Yeah, I didn't mean her to observation, No, that's okay. Her observation about them putting uh, Culber and Stamets in there as the gay couple, they behave just like a a heterosexual couple. It's like, well, what's the point of having a gay couple if they're just, you know, they're fitting this stereotype, which I agree with that. And it was like really overdone. And they're like, you know, you know, you had Colbert who was like just the, he did what was he there for? Right. <laughs> just kind of yeah, like well, passive, you know, he was just, I don't know if you always have to make a statement with your characters. Yeah, they were just but trying to be so heavy handed and hit you over the head with it. You don't, I mean, and, and on Discovery... Um, so look how cool was, we are. These are gay Is it characters. Michelle Tran? I want to say that was the captain. And that may be the wrong name completely. Uh, you mean Michelle Yeoh? Oh, they changed it? Yeah, they changed it. <laughs> Michelle Yeoh. <laughs> I liked her as a captain, and then they mm-hmm. kill her off. I know. <laughs> now, I cannot, for whatever reason, I don't know the other lady's name, and I only mm-hmm. saw... Uh, in all fairness, one episode of it because I refuse to pay for CBS All Access. I just think I mean, that's Michael Burnham, wrong. the main character. Of the yeah, series. I don't. I did not care for her character. I think she should have been thrown in the space or she's in all the over the place to begin. You know, yeah, she made no sense in that. You know, now I know she's we're supposed d- to be raised by Vulcans, but then she gets mits mutiny on a whim, which yeah. ends up in the death of her captain. And, you know, and then she gets sent off to the, you know, Well, there's prison. a brilliant episode where... <laughs> this is stupid. In the series, uh, the original series of Star Trek, where um, Spock 
has to do mutiny, but it, it it's not as heavy handed as what she does. Right. And you, if you remember the whole ep- the point of that episode right. was that why is Spock doing this? This is so out of character. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. It took the whole episode to come around to the point where they explained why he did why it. Why he did it, and it, you know, it's, I guess for the greater good, right? You know. Well, it was totally to understandable because yeah, that yeah. was you had to unwrap all these layers and this. And whole, that's what made it fascinating. But yeah. her character is just annoying to begin with. Tonight, today, I think I'll just commit mutiny. Yeah. Because I think the King Klingons are evil and I'm a bigot and I think they all should die. And so I'm not going to listen to my captain. And Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but the Spock had that great story arc, but but Michael is Michael Burnham, character? yeah. Yeah. I just think she was just standoffish to be standoffish. And, and I get a little bit of that. Mm. You know, I can accept a little bit of that. But yeah. Anyway, this is. I, I don't like it. I don't like it when it's force fed and beat us over the head with it. But um, yeah, where do you want to go from here on your conversation? Uh, I don't know. I was, you want to go back to the Roddenberry stuff? We kind of yes, got, yes. I'm, I'm all sorry. I'm all grumpy and like uh, <laughs> yeah. We, we're not trying to be negative, but we're trying to point out some valid points that we feel that uh, you, you kids know. get off my lawn. You kids <clears> get off my lawn exactly. No, I mean, I, I mean, I had just there's a couple other points about Roddenberry's track, which is not present in the the new J.J. Trek or Discovery or uh, we need to talk about the what's okay. coming down the pike too with the Picard thing but which I'm super excited for but super worried about right. oh I Picard. thought you were being sarcastic <laughs> oh no 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 I, I would love uh, I, w- I think this is kind of like what they're trying to do with episode 9 Disney's trying to save Star Wars mm. from the bit massive backlash they've had from fans over The Last Jedi especially Solo and there's people out there that love those films, and uh, they're okay, but, you know, and I won't get into all that. But I think that's kind of what they're doing to bring a Picard back. And, and, and Patrick Stewart said he'd never come back. to. He felt that the Picard story was done, and he said, and he agreed the only way he'd come back to it. I know I'm getting these are warning signs. There's just like big red flags everywhere. I feel like it's a desperation thing, but if Patrick Stewart believes in it enough that he can come back and show Picard in a way, because he doesn't necessarily want Picard to be, you know, just picking up where he left off on Nemesis or, or, or on the, the next generation on the television show. He wants to take it in a different way. And, and I may or may not like that if I get to see it at all. But um, so yeah. if Patrick Stewart's down for it, then I I trust him enough. And I think Star Trek, the companies, the powers that be, I think they've seen how much doggone backlash on ep- on season one there was that, you know, now they're saying, okay, let's pull out. This is what scares me too. It's the double-edged sword. Let's pull out Picard. Everybody loves Picard. Yeah, right. You know, it's kind of like with, with J.J. Abrams, let's bring back Luke Skywalker for Force Awakens. And we just see him at the end of Force Awakens, even though I love that retelling of episode four, basically, mm-hmm. with new characters. I loved it. I love Force Awakens. But then Last Jedi, we you know, they did a disservice to his character. I get what they're going, Ryan Johnson was going, but it's a disservice. And I'm sorry, I'm back off the track there. So back with the Roddenberry Star Trek. Right. Um, yeah. So along with the moral aspect of all the episodes and the fact that, uh, you know, it was all about exploration, which is kind of like a metaphor for human progress. Okay. You know, moving forward, expanding, <laughs> finding, you know, new new frontiers, frontiers to, right yeah, to it's conquer. progress yeah. um there was also you know star trek had a post scarcity economy you know there's no money <laughs> yeah <laughs> which it, there was money in the federation but it wasn't needed like you don't have to have, the pursuit have, to have of money. wealth wasn't the thing that drove people after zephyr conquer and in first contact we realized we're not alone in the universe mm. which brought the world quite literally together and right. so that we could work towards a greater purpose. Right. And so the, yeah. And so when we started investing in those technologies, it came to a tipping point where now you have, you know, there's more energy than we're going to need. And then once, you know, of course the replicators were developed now it's a post scarcity economy because energy is free or virtually free. And you have a machine that can create anything out of energy 
Pretty much, yeah. And you have infinite energy. So you got anything you need, right? So the nobody, there's no scarcity at all. Right. So nobody has to work anymore. There's no want. You know, you yeah. can you can totally pursue if you're. Um, and I don't know if it was called the Masterpiece Society. I, I, I call it that, but that might be the name of the episode from the Next Generation, mm-hmm. where you had the people that in that one colony, I think they were humans, and they were genetically yeah. bred. Like the guy was the leader, and he was so charismatic. And remember, Deanna went down there and yep. kind of fell in love with the guy, and but then realized she could Contaminated their biosphere. Right, right exactly, yeah. yeah. And they, they there was that whole ethical dilemma in the Prime Directive, which, you know, sometimes it's just used as toilet paper because, <laughs> you know, we're like, throw that out the window. You know, we don't need that anymore. But um, which Insurrection talks about in the movie and it goes, it's a vein in all of the movies and in, in the series. But the fact that, you know, like certain people are almost bred to do certain things and that's taking it to an extreme. But what you're, I think, kind of saying is that we... As well, a species, we just eliminated involved. the need for money. We I mean, need, yeah. yeah. When, and, when you have infinite energy and a machine that can make anything out of energy, then you don't need money. Right. And so that was basically the now. You don't have to have poverty. Foundation. You don't have to have war. You know, we we have infinite resources. Like so you said, yeah. So. so if you wanted to study geology, then you didn't. There's nothing standing in your way. Standing you know, you didn't have way, to go yeah. get a day job or whatever. Right. If you, you wanted know. to, you know, be an artist, you didn't have to get a day job. If you wanted, so whatever filmmaking was like back. Well, they had hol- holodex. So I, I wonder what happened to the film industry then. <laughs> Or well, I mean, in an <laughs> enterprise, there's a, you know they actually watch movies on board. True, that's yeah. true. So, or, but, or or Data's classical concerts, right? Concerts. <laughs> uh, but you know, so the, the whole focus was okay. Now humanity can just do whatever we need to do to better ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing was, uh, the, I think I already mentioned this, but the potential goodness of humanity. Um, you know, the idea that when you free people up from having to have a quote day job, then most people are going to choose to do something meaningful right. versus just sit on their butt all day. Whether so. it's volunteering or if it's, you know, something creative. Follow your passion, yeah. Yeah, you definitely can follow your passion. Um, then there's the pursuit of knowledge uh, and understanding, uh, which, like I just mentioned a few minutes ago, the space exploration was a metaphor for that, you know, as far as knowledge and progress. Um, and then also free inquiry, uh you know, there's universal education, of course, and healthcare, uh, uninhibited attitudes towards sexuality. You know, all that is like is n- as close to utopia as you could possibly get. Um, and the whole underlying concept of Roddenberry's humanism, which he, you know, put into Star Trek, right. was that humans are capable of improving themselves individually and as a society and you know it's just it's something we can do all we have to do is to choose to do it that's it we are definitely more than the sum of our programming Mm -hmm. you know yeah so that's you know that's what jj track and discovery are missing and you want to talk about discovery yeah yeah let's roll right into it and this this is where things get dark (laughs) yeah so lita gold uh is a and i don't agree with everything she said in her essay but uh, there was something she wrote called The Dismal Frontier. It's on currentaffairs.org. Um, but there are a couple of quotes that I think are awesome. Uh, the first one is, and this is this, I've really needed a way to put this into words that I haven't been able to. Right. So now I have it. <laughs> and okay. Here it is. Here she says, go. I suppose discovery is exciting in the way that watching endless footage of car crashes is exciting, <laughs> but it's not Star Trek. And that's exactly how I feel about it. The whole thing. It's, yeah, okay, great. It's exciting, but it's not Star Trek. And so I'm not going to refer to it as Star Trek. I think <laughs> at least the first, I refuse. the first episode of Discovery, it looked beautiful. I had a problem with the ship being kind of a Klingon. It's like gray, or I mean brown, excuse me, yeah. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's like we're, we're going DC Universe on this, you know, kind of dark, and I, I don't get it. But um, there are a lot of problems I had with Discovery. And, and the pointless rotating saucer section that... Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, you're right. You're totally right. But yeah, the darker, grittier kind of, I, I don't mind seeing something like that, but I, it just, nothing about Discovery really felt like Star Trek. Everything yeah. was too, it seemed like they spent more money on 
the props and everything and the special effects, which were good, I guess. So before and we lessen the story. Yeah. So before we get into the reason for that, which okay, I it, I have struggled like for gosh ever since two thousand and nine. You know why is this so weird? Why is this weird stuff happening? <laughs> what are they doing to Star Trek? Why? You know I can't understand. Right. All right. Well, I finally kind of gotten a little bit of an explanation to it, but. Before we get into that, okay. um, she also says, Gold says also a couple things about the enlightened, you know, I guess that does figure into that, uh, why Discovery is not Star Trek. But she talks about prestige TV. Have you heard of that? I actually have not. I hadn't either. So, all right, so I had to do a little bit of Googling around to try to figure out what it is. It's really not real def- well-defined, but it's kind of, the examples are Game of Thrones, House of Cards, you know, all these high profile TV shows that mm-hmm. everybody watches, right? And everybody talks about around the water cooler. Right. Especially right. Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. Especially Game of Thrones. Because I think that's the that's the biggest one. Yeah. But the the thing that drives those series forward, if you watched House of Cards, it was the same way. I actually just quit House of Cards because it's at one point it just got ridiculous. It's like, okay, what new shocking more shocking or thing can we do this week? Right. Than last week to make everybody go, oh snap, you know. And but just Game say, of wow, Thrones is, is crazy. I think different because it's always engaging, e- even when some of it feels like filler. Mm. You know, it's still I still feel like we're looking at a small piece of a greater puzzle. When you put it all together and look at it from a distance, it's mm. going to make a lot of sense, and it's going to be maybe a powerful yeah. or, or pivotal pivotal moment you know yeah. well like game of thrones when they killed ned stark first season like you can't kill your main character <laughs> right i still think he's coming back <laughs> I, i'm not against game of thrones i didn't right. I, I don't i don't really like it i haven't gotten into it yeah. but westworld is one that i've really gotten into a lot of people like westworld and I that's just con- not that's, been able to yeah that's definitely yet. considered prestige tv too and so it fits into that same paradigm of okay. you know shocking her and more shocking her Right, but you know, so that's okay. That's a thing, right? It exists, you know, and to some degree, you know, I'll watch some of that too. But mm-hmm. it just it gets wearisome, you know, at some point. The Game of Thrones template of murder, sex, and unexpected resurrections makes for high ratings and th- thrilling recaps. And I think that's definitely the way they were going with True. Discovery. You know, are those they yours, wanted to make your a, words? Those are her words. Her words. Okay. But I totally. Agree. <laughs> okay. Because yeah, it's obvious that they're trying to go that way with Discovery, mm-hmm. the Prestige TV route. Um, two other words that she used that I like were well, one other was grim dark cynicism. Wow. To describe it, yeah. <laughs> this was, yeah. That sounds really. I it, was, like. it was a good article. I read it. You yeah. Know. Let me. Can I like? She goes on a rant about sure. Kurtzman. I'd like to really read too. <laughs> go ahead. Where she says. Uh, Oh, sorry. She, so she calls Kurtzman, Alex Kurtzman, which is the showrunner for Discovery. All right. right. Uh, she calls him the relentless mediocrity responsible for the witless sci-fi flops such as The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Ender's Game, and the 2017 Mummy reboot. By the end of Discovery's second episode, ta- Captain George Yu is dead, and Burnham has single-handedly started a war with the Klingons. <laughs> The show quickly slides into grim, dark chaos, lurching from one hideous crisis to another, which is absolute truth. After episode six, I just couldn't do it anymore. Uh, a sinister new captain, war, misery, despair, a giant alien monster, a crew member slaughtered by said giant alien monster. The giant alien monster is actually a helpless creature with useful abilities. So the sinister captain orders it hooked up to an instantaneous transport system, even though this causes the alien considerable pa- considerable pain. <laughs> oh no! Then there's torture. Some more torture. Captain George's corpse gets cannibalized by the Klingons. PTSD. The sinister captain captain was secretly an evil mirror universe uh, from the evil mirror universe the whole time. Burnham's boring boyfriend was equally a Klingon the whole time. Thrills, chills, explosions, and possibly high stakes. And I just, I really love the wording. <laughs> because that is brilliant. It's just, oh. it's exhausting just like watching the episodes is exhausting. Wow. <laughs> you know, but that's exactly, that's a great she summary. She some wonderful points there. That's exactly how I felt trying to watch through. Like I said, I got I, through episode six. And I just Honestly, I never got past the first episode and I wasn't going to pay for CBS All Access. I know AMC's trying that with yeah. The Walking Dead and stuff like that. And I've kind of 
burned out on Walking Dead, you know, even though the new trailer looks pretty awesome for the next season. And then they announced that Rick is not no longer going to be on the series. I don't, really don't. You can't Ned Stark it. I'm sorry. You're not Game of Thrones. And I hate that Game of Thrones is coming to an end. <laughs> mm, but, yeah. but yeah, yeah. I think she hits the nail on the head a, a lot on that. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you a question. What do you think about the whole, uh, you know, Kurtzman has on the record is repeatedly saying that Discovery is in the Prime Universe. I don't see that at all. No, nah. we're not fans. Are not buying it, dude. The, we're not. We're <laughs> not. Um, no, no. Yeah, uh, so emphatically reason, no. All right, so there, it's another prequel. Oh dear. Yet another prequel. We're doing prequels again. Um, the complaints that I agree with are the inconsistent aesthetic. Like, there's technology that shows up that you never saw in Enterprise, even though this is supposed to be before Enterprise. <laughs> Or, you know, I'm sorry. So is this after, before Enterprise no, after, or the after, original series? Between after? Enterprise and the original series, yeah. So it's, just, uh, it's stuff like, you know, I'm sorry, a what? A mycelial network that you're going to use to travel instantaneously through space. That makes no sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's fungus. Wow. Okay, whatever. <laughs> I've never known fungus to transport me anywhere except to the doctor. Uh, <laughs> the Klingons. The look I of the Klingons. Hate, hate the look of the Klingons. Now, I read an early article how it said that they're going to evolve and there's like some disease or something that makes them <laughs> change or something. I don't know if that's true or whatever. I read it on the internet, so it must yeah. be true, right? I've, I've heard but, rumors that that would have been the kind of the non-canon explanation of what now, happened to the Klingons. If you remember Voyager, they had the very history. disturbing episode. I think it was called F- The Phage or whatever, yeah. where they had right, right. that kind of deforming mm-hmm. whatever virus. That worked. That worked in it, but mm. it didn't necessarily. Well, it changed the species to it to an extent, but I, I know they're not like going that melted. way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's kind of really weird, but um, but yeah, I I don't get, I I don't like anything. My very first view of the Klingons, like, who are these people? They're not Klingons. Hey, look, yeah. it's the Zindi from Enterprise. <gasps> yeah, you I was I wasn't a big fan the, of the Zindi. I mean, the li- I went the, with um, the whole idea of yeah, the Sulaban. No, the lizard. What was it? There's like okay, so there are several. Uh, there were the arboreals like the, and the like an insectoid. Yeah, insect, the insectoids. Uh, thank you. The insectoid like that. Zindi. That, that okay. felt like <laughs> that felt like episode two of Star Wars, where the you know they had the um, banking clan and mm-hmm. the, you know the, Dooku was meeting with all them and they're right, building right. the Death Star essentially or the plants for it and all that. Mm-hmm. It felt like that where they you know that council of different types of people and they're showing the diversity of humanoids ish or whatever. I don't know if insectoids are considered humanoid. I guess not, but you know what I mean? You know, different <laughs> right. species or whatever. It's a different we're... evolutionary yeah. uh, like branch, you yeah. know, if we, you know, if we had, if the dinosaurs but yeah, hadn't been killed, I, I that would be lizard people. absolutely hate the Klingons and discovery. There's not much I like about discovery at all. In... Mm-hmm. So how about the Vulcan psychic superpowers? Which I think like, eventually, maybe <laughs> during evolution, but guess what? Spock didn't have that. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, yeah. he's the not stuff, Professor X. <laughs> right. <laughs> Picard was, played Professor X, and he had those, but that was an X Men. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We could go on a probably. I get the mind meld thing. I get, I get it, but it's it, for me, it's too much of a leap going that far back because you're literally rewriting Star Trek history. You know, just mm-hmm. call this an alternate timeline. Just uh, J.J. Abrams is or J.J. Track it, mm. but even then he he tried to at least you know glue it together to the the prime timeline a little bit and having Nimoy come over and do the time travel stuff and that sort of worked. It worked a lot better than whatever this is that they're calling in the prime universe because this is not the prime universe. Mm-hmm. And I originally and and maybe they're going to change it to this, but Discovery the way I originally thought it was going to be, or I understood it to be, it was going to be different ships with different captains and different timelines. That would have been interesting to me. You know, if this is just, if what we supposedly saw season one and they just leave that in its own little pocket universe or whatever, or part of the universe and, or during a a certain timeline and then we skip into the 23rd, 24th century or whatever. And you see a, Something like Picard's universe or something that's closer to that, 
without copying it too much and making it original, if that makes sense. You know, I don't have a problem with them skipping. I do a little bit, but I don't have a great problem with them skipping around. But calling the events in Star Trek Discovery as part of the Prime timeline, I totally disagree with. I, this is not... Don't even call it Star Trek. And if I may, we did some episodes on here on Geek Home World Podcast where we talked about Star Trek Orville is what fans wanted Star Trek Discovery to be. (laughs) And Star Trek Star Trek Orville we thought was gonna be just dumb screwball comedy. I totally love that. And I mean it was even more serious and they they had the same sex things. They had some of the social justice warrior stuff in there, but it wasn't heavy handed. It went with the storyline. It it felt like it it was organic to the storyline. You know, they had different, they dealt with some very hefty topics in there. Well, Next Generation did too. I mean, yeah, it, definitely. All the for its time. Yeah. And, but the Orville does everything so much better. I can't point to hardly any episodes of the Orville and not be proud of them and saying, thank God the Orville came out because it's what Star Trek Discovery wishes it could be, you know, and it's what. What the fans wish, wish discovery. The fans, yeah, yeah, and I'm a fan, so yeah, you know, make mine Orville instead of <laughs> Discovery, you know. Mm-hmm. Let this go, crash that starship already, okay? So, all right, so here's... Sorry, the, no, I had no, to you're good. This, So the question is, why is this happening? That's my question. I have not understood this ever since the original reboot movie came out in 2009. Like, what is going JJ on? J.J. Trek. Now, why is... why what Reboot... What you know? I mean, I, I kind of chalked it up to the just the general trend of remaking everything, you know. Yeah. But it's not that. And this is what I found out. All right. So in 2005, uh, CBS and Paramount mm-hmm. split. Now, this is some corporate shenanigan yeah, crap that I yeah. don't understand. But that's whatever it means. <laughs> so I guess this is a demerger. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how this works. But anyway. Yeah. The two split up, and the pr- the problem is that CBS, which is not the old CBS, this is a whole bunch of bullcrap. So I'm just repeating what I've been told. All right? right. So the the new CBS, excuse me, new CBS gets some of the Star Trek stuff, and the new Paramount, which is not the old Paramount, right, gets some of the Star Trek stuff. So CBS got control of all of the original series and the, the next the generation, next generation era right. and enterprise Including TV the episodes, collectibles and all, right, the, all the toys, toys and everything. licensing and marketing stuff. Right. The only thing that Paramount, the new Paramount, I have to right. keep saying the new Paramount because yep. it's not the old Paramount. This is You're a right. new corporation, right? <laughs> the mm-hmm. new Paramount got control of the 10 feature films. All right. So Paramount comes up, wants to make another feature film based on star Trek. Star Trek 14, which would be. They have to contact CBS, who at the time, the, and I have her name here, uh, the head of CBS, which I can't find at the moment. Anyway, so the head of Paramount, you know, the executives of Paramount have to go to the executives of CBS Mm -hmm. and say, this is what we're going to do. Well, CBS says, no, you can't do that. And so there's this big, from what I hear, is this big haggling going back and forth. That's okay. We'll make an agreement. You can make your make movies based off of the Star Trek franchise, but they have to be. And this is ridiculous, but this was the stipulation. CBS said, which was who was led by Les Moonves, right? All right, said it has to be stylistically different, right? Than the Star Trek that everybody knows and loves. The That's, Star Trek that everybody wants. <laughs> exactly. Which is, is crazy. So it was a legal stipulation that caused the whole reboot. Just throw everything out the window and they'll start over from scratch with the same characters mentality. Not anything's creative. Not anything, you know, so, hey, this is the best thing for the you know what the fans want. It was a... Right. Legally, we can't do this, so we're going to have to go this route. And that's where the whole... And I won't go on a big rant here, I promise, but it's similar in Star Wars. They forced on the fans what they thought the fans wanted, maybe from a business, maybe from a social awareness perspective in that Mm -hmm. sense. 
and it's not necessarily what the fans want. They'll they'll take some of it, but you've got the fans are your consumers, and you've got to give the fans what they want. Or guess what? They're not going to show up to see your movies. And with Star Trek, mm. they're not going to watch your show either. If you you do stuff like this, they they need to come together, kind of like well, Marvel and Fox, you know, and mm. where there was. Um, when they had the big wiki leak or whatever it was um, during Spider-Man, we found out about Spider-Man too. And Andrew mm-hmm. Garfield remember all that went down. And if it yeah, wasn't for bit, that, yeah. that, that got some of the stuff going in those emails coming out. And I'm not saying that was a good thing necessarily or a bad thing, but that got the conversation started. Oh my gosh. And then we can bring Spider-Man. They made a deal to bring Spider-Man in the civil war. Now Spider-Man is part of the MCU and they share it. They, they see, they're doing it the right way. Mm. CBS and Paramount. I'm not so sure. I don't like. I don't like the direction it's going. No, no. It's yeah. It's two different groups of executives, right? With two different groups of creative teams that are doing two different things and trying to make money off of Star Trek. Right. All right. Now they're peddling it on the corner to make yeah. a buck. And Moonves doesn't. And the executives at CBS don't want to invest money into doing new Star Trek series. Right. They just want to make money off of the old stuff they've already got mm-hmm. and licensing, you know, new merchandise, basically. And, like, you remember, which this is actually a good thing that, you know, CBS did the Blu-ray releases of the Next Generation stuff. Right. Which is fantastic. Yes. You know, with all sorts of extra features and stuff. But they're not interested in doing new Star Trek. CBS is not. And, unfortunately, they're the ones who hold the library and the rights to all the old good Star Trek that we all know. Right. So Paramount is doing their separate thing. Now, here's where it gets really hairy, and this is kind of scary. And you're talking about the Picard thing? Right, right. All right. Uh, So you know that the first reboot film made a lot of money. Yeah. Right. And actually, In the Darkness made even more money than that one, which is odd because it's kind of panned by the fans. It's like the least favorite, even among the J.J. Trek you know, fan crowd. It, it has a different flavor to it. I mean, yeah, yeah. I've talked about you know the pros and cons of that, but uh, no cons, no, no pun intended. Cons, yeah, C-O-N-S. all right, gotcha. But cons. um, all right. So Beyond is the one that they're saying is not as profitable. I actually think, looking at the boxes, I think that they got progressively. I think the totals, depending if you're looking at domestic box office versus global, Mm -hmm. I actually think they got, as they went on, one, two, and three, as I call them, Mm -hmm. in JJ Trek, they they got less profitable. I think I don't don't exactly. Yeah. So I I, well. So whatever the box office is, the actual and however much promotion and stuff they put behind it. So you had JJ Abrams Star Trek, then you had Into Darkness, then you had Beyond, and. Flipping the script, I think, obviously, from my list, Beyond's, I think, the better of the three. Right. Me too. And, and, okay, you agree with that. But, yeah, the profitability, it's a sliding curve going down. And if you're an economist and if you're looking at just at the bottom line, if you mm. don't care about creativity, which is not where you should be, by the way, you got to watch the bottom line, but you got to look at the creative side and what the fans want. Obviously, the fans are not enjoying this. They're enjoying it to an extent. It's kind of keeping us satiated, you know, and the fact that we have some Star Trek out there and we do like the films, but they're not. They're pretty, but they're just dumb. They're on a downward trajectory <laughs> and they're not, they're not prime. You know, I, I don't, well, they're more. They're closer to Prime than Discovery is. Discovery is nowhere near the Prime universe. You know, the Mm. Kelvin is universe, as they're calling it. So let's talk about that. All right. So the first two films, you know, were co-written by Roberto Orsi and Alex Kurtzman. Right. Okay. Now, guess who's show running the CBS? Discovery. Kurtzman. Kurtzman. How weird is that? What's going on behind the scenes here? I get the influence of the J.J. Abrams Star Trek films coming into, no pun intended, into, I call it almost darkness, uh, um, (laughs) Discovery because it's so dark. Mm. Um, I can see the influence of that more than The Next Generation because it's just of the time it's made. It's kind of like Superman, the original Superman trilogy you know, or whatever films versus Superman. Now we're never going to have a Christopher Reeve type 
of Superman ever again. You know, mm-hmm. we're, we're going to, we got a more grittier, darker Superman and, you know, and I think they're trying to lighten that up, but it's, it's kind of the same thing. You're kind of of the time, you know, the original series of Star Trek is not going to, you know, of course the next generation is going to look more advanced. It should, it, you know, it's of a different time, better graphics, better, you know, CGI, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I don't think that's what we're talking about here. That, really, not, I think it's more the contractual obligations wow. of Paramount yeah. to, you know, that CVS is like saying, no, no, you can't. It has to be different, you know, and that's really what is the bottom line as to why the whole Kelvin timeline took place at all, really. Um, but anyway, on to the mm-hmm. future, which... Yeah, I have a little clever title here in my notes called The Picard Maneuver. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that, The Picard Maneuver. You know what The Picard Maneuver is, right? Yes. You know, everything where he pulls his Yeah, yeah, when down. he pulls his shirt <laughs> Picard, became, Yeah, there's like been memes on that. Yeah. It's funny, yeah. All right, so w- there seems to be some stuff going on. And you know that there's been a lot of, you know, the fans were lied to about Khan being beyond, it wasn't Khan, and it was Khan, and then it's like, you know. I think they kind of felt bad i think abrams felt bad after the fact that he didn't he wasn't just honest with mm-hmm. outright and said this is con but I've, i think he was afraid of the backlash too yeah you know and um so there's a lot of stuff going on right that's right. not being they're not it's, paramount in particular but cbs is guilty too are not being honest with the fans there's behind the scenes stuff that has to do with money and copyright and legal issues right. that they're not involving us. They're in. holding back the hands of the creative ones to, to totally, bring these together. Totally yeah. at the whim of the, the money, right? The bean yeah. counters. It, but, you know, new plans for Paramount and Star Trek, you know, you've heard about this, like there's, they're floating the idea of an animated series and then there might be a series on Starfleet Academy and then there might be a Quentin Tarantino movie that's R-rated Star Trek. That worries What the me. heck? You that know what I mean? Me. Yeah, I feel like we're. I feel like the Star Trek we know is falling apart, and it's like literally. I feel like the the rivets are coming out the plane as it's going down, or as the ship. There's like different parts of the ship falling off, and they're in a a semi controlled descent. Hmm. It's kind of like I feel like with Star Wars, and you know, they Episode Nine has to redeem, has to pull pull this back up, you know, and mm-hmm. and I think Star Trek has to do that the bean counters and the powers that be they need to let the creative people give the fans what they want and pull star trek out of this slow decline or it may be even a steady decline you know they've got to right the ship as it were you know and on that note you're talking you know that the fourth reboot film which they had planned they were going to have chris hemsworth and chris pine in and hemsworth playing kurt's father again right and but paramount is taking this tack now that they learn from beyond which the budget seemed to have gotten increasingly larger with mm-hmm. the Star Trek reboot well, films. They because you're like, look at all this money we're making. Let's just you know throw money at it. And so the the Paramount strategy now is to lower the budgets. I think that's I think a lot of that's similar to what DC's doing. You know mm-hmm. because they're realizing they're losing they're losing their butt on their films because people aren't coming out to see them. And it Quote is unquote, similar losing their butt. Meaning they're not making the bazillions that they want. Yeah, they're, they're not making, making. They're, they're making, making half bazillion. a bazillion instead right, of a exactly. zillion <laughs> dollars. And but it can still comes back to to giving the fans what they want, and and you know they're not delivering. Star Trek's not delivering. Yeah. So Helmsworth and Pine are out. Yeah, yeah. When they, they announced say, they nope, were out, that's I need, you know I don't I want need ten million, not six million dollars. You know, or whatever. I don't know how much. They're I can't say I blame over, them. You know, I can't say I blame them as an actor necessarily. I mean, I understand work, the economics of it. Yeah, yeah. And the negotiations. But the thing but is, it's still um, kind of absurd. Without Chris Pine, Chris Pine has done a wonderful job as a Picard. I mean, I think the best that we could do for a Picard, as far as I can see. You mean a Kirk? God, I said Picard. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm. I'm so. I got you. I'm, I'm with person. you. Yeah, he's done. <laughs> they changed it again. Yeah, they changed it. Uh, yeah, but he's done the best Kirk. I like Zachary Quinto's, even though he's not, you know, a favorite Spock, obviously. He's done a good job. Yeah. And I don't think there's any question of either of their acting skills. Sure, it's not, the material. And that goes for most, pretty much most of the cast. To, and, me, is the, uh, to me, it's just they should have just come up with new characters. 
Yeah. Just come up with new characters. You don't just don't. <laughs> you just don't do it. Yeah. And, and, and it almost felt like, you know, there was a little, maybe now seeing that Chris Pine isn't in Star Trek 14 or whatever it's going to be called, if mm. there's going to be, uh, they may be. Paramount saying, oh, yeah, that's, not, that's cool. You know, we didn't need those guys anywhere. We're going to do the but movie without I them. Think, <laughs> I think there may have been and may still be a a bit of a clause in there that they have to go so many years before. They have to, if they don't make a Star Trek, they lose, it reverts the license with, you know, so they'll probably mm-hmm. spit out, a, they're, they're probably, you know, everybody's scratching their heads and say, we got to get a Star Trek episode 14 or whatever, mm-hmm. Star Trek 14 out. And we've got to figure it, you know, and maybe this is, maybe this is what they need. Maybe, you know, usually things run in trilogies mm-hmm. in movies. So maybe it's time to bring on a whole new cast of characters. Don't call it Kirk. Maybe like you said, you know, for the movies, you know, just movie sake, or they may be going the, like the route of DC and kind of ramping down the movies and trying to get into, well, DC's not necessarily getting into TV. They are, are they, they do a pretty good job, better job at TV than they do at the movies. Mm-hmm. And maybe Star Trek is trying to do that and, and it get more ingrained because I, I don't think that this, generation coming up is taking to star trek the way that obviously we have well it, uh, yeah because it doesn't have the uh intellectual and moral cash that right and you you not you substance. have to address the problems of the day that was always the strength of star trek you know, the the gene roddenberry utopia is not a perfect world you'll never get a perfect world but you can have a better society. We're always getting there. But we're always getting there, and we're always trying. We're striving. We're not being down and dirty and negative about things. There's enough negativity in this world right now. Star Trek needs to be, like Superman should be, a beacon of hope. You know? Right. I, you know, Gold, going back to Gold's article again, it was, you know, yeah. I think her term was, and I didn't write this down, but it was the, and it's like her, she was saying that it pervades a lot of science fiction right now, is there's this, um, you don't have to be good. You just have to be better than the bad guy, right, is the concept. Well, they're like, writing the bad guys. I mean, Killmonger from Black Panther. Thank Thanos, you. they're writing them better. I, you know, and I've said I understand their motives. You know, they at least they're not good as good, bad as bad, and there's nothing wrong with that. But, yeah, we're having much more interesting villains. The Dark Knight was so much good because mm. of how strongly written and how and the great performance of Heath Ledger, you know, yeah. he made Batman better. The Joker makes Batman better and we need better villains, but we're almost to, we've almost got, like you said, it's almost like bads taking over evil in, in, I mean, it is interesting is one thing, but yeah. you know, when you have your hero is simply somebody who, if they're you know, it's just slightly better than the villain. Yeah. You're not, what is there to strive for? You know I mean? Is there's like, there's no, you know, with. Are we striving for balance? Are we striving for, you know, what? Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. Every character in the next generation had something they were striving for, right? Data right. was trying to become more human. Picard was trying to be the best leader that he possibly could and right. navigate more. Control world. his emotions. Being, being a diplomat. I mean, if anybody could have been assimilated by the Borg and survived it, it's, it's Captain Picard. He just had that mental discipline. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there are four lights. <laughs> Remember that episode? I mean, yeah. how incredible. Um, but the characters we're getting now are just not heroic, I guess, if you want to put it that way. Well, could it be an oversaturation of... All the and I'm not knocking Marvel because I think they've done a spectacular job, but all these heroes, larger than life heroes, maybe our heroes are. It seems like our villains are becoming more heroic, and our heroes are becoming a little bit more muddy, like you're saying. So it's maybe they're trying to make a balance and shift the balance. They're they're trying to JJ Trek into darkness, essentially, mm. and flip. They totally flip the script there with Khan, you know, to an extent. And maybe that's what they're they're trying to do. I mean, I don't know. It's great to understand the motivations of a villain. Right. You know, and why they became a villain and all that. I don't know why that's caused people other than just, yeah, we're bored with that idea and we're going to move on to something else, regardless of how unethical it is, to push the character into the point where it's like, okay, 
now we're going to have you not only understand why this person is a villain, but now we want you to relate to their villainy. Right. And that's a no-no. Well, I keep coming back to Killmonger, probably one of the best written villains, especially in, in, in the MCU, but he changes Black Panther. He changes his, his thoughts completely, and he basically takes on the mantle of Killmonger, but in a positive way, you know, he takes what he has to say and he's like, okay, I'm just not saying you're bad to be bad. You're, you have a reason and I understand your reasoning and your reasoning in some ways you've bested me as the hero. You're, you're, you've somehow bested me in, in your philosophy and I'm going to adopt that philosophy, but I'm going to use my positive way of doing it, not your negative way of destruction, you know, and, mm. and the suppression that Killmonger has seen, you know, in the outside world in, in context of Black Panther. So I, th- I, I think we're kind of at that point, you know, we're at a point where they're, I think overall they're trying to, to find that balance and failing, failing. <laughs> well, it's really, it's no, it's like most of the storytelling. What would you do it's, if you were in charge of, if you were the, all right, Char- so I, you know, I'm not like the person to say, you know, I'm okay. the ultimate authority on this. However, mm-hmm. I can point you to how it was solved in okay. the Next Generation <laughs> okay. era okay. of storytelling. This is fascinating. Which one just came to my mind, which uh, was, and uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the episode. It was the episode where Rogadanar, the guy who is, he was a soldier, uh, was mm-hmm. part of this society that had programmed, you know, these soldiers to, uh, to be, you know, basically super soldiers. I know what you're talking about. Then when they tried to reintegrate them in the society, they couldn't, so they put them all on a penal colony on the moon. It almost sounds like the Jim Hadar, doesn't it? Yeah, sort of. In a way? Yeah. Okay, but I, but I know the episode you're talking about. Yeah, Yeah. so they put all these these former veterans, right? So they, right. they fought the wars that they needed them to fight, and then when they couldn't reintegrate them in the society because of their violent tendencies, which... PTSD, whatever. Sounds they like them Vietnam off to veterans to an extent. Yeah, yeah. So you know, whole, they kind of marginalized them or put them, you know. So Picard yeah. comes in, you know, in the middle of this mess to right. help out the official government on the world, right? Right. That's who he's responding to. That's their dim- diplomatic obligation is to help this world and finds out, ah, there's been this un- injustice done to these veterans because they were you know, um, conditioned right. by the government. And then now the government doesn't want to deal with the problem. They just want to ship them off to prison. And so, he, or, or, or they've outlived their usefulness to that government. So yeah. Yeah. That so I think way. the way that would be handled now would be that whoever our hero or our protagonist would be, would be, would step in and take the side of the terrorists, right? The, right. The, because that's what the, these veterans were doing. It's like they were going. They were going to escape prison and then attack the world, right? So they, they, all they had, all they knew how to do is just fight. Fight. They, and so you know the the solution now would be to take the side of these guys, right? Let's just tear it all down. Let's destroy the this you know bunch of stuffy uptight people in this world and teach them you know the lesson. Right. Whereas Picard steps in in the episode, and the way it's handled is. That uh, he brings Danar, who's the main, mm-hmm. you know, not, we say antagonist, he's not a villain, the, pro, the main antagonist, to the leaders of the world. And he says, okay, if you guys drop your weapons, they're not going to attack because they're programmed only to attack aggressive right. opponents. Right? Sounds so, like the so Borg they, in a way. Yeah, so they drop all their weapons, and so the conditioned warriors cannot kill them, right? Because it's against their programming. Right. And Picard just leaves. <laughs> and the Enterprise takes off and says, okay, fix it. You know? So it, it was dealt with in a way where it's like he took the moral high road instead of saying, okay, you're right. These guys did you wrong. I don't like them anyway. They're stuffy. He was a They're true uptight. Arbiter. They're jerks so yeah let's go just kill them all yeah it's like nope i'm gonna figure out a way to put these people into this situation where they're going to have to solve their problem right they're going to have to compromise and meet together and figure it out 
that's and you know, and it wasn't said how they figured it out. How in the world do they deprogram? I don't know. The the whole argument that sending them to prison from the first place was that they couldn't fix them. So you know, it's just it was, there's a there was a non acceptance of that whole concept. No, there is no no fixing it. In our you in fix our your problems in our you don't tear things down. You don't destroy everything like right. we're seeing now, and especially in our political discourse now to bring well i was thinking about like the prison system there's a lot of people that are are sent to incarcerated and sent to prison they don't know what to do with them it's it's a business to an extent Mm -hmm. you know and yeah there are people that belong there but there's no rehabilitation for these people and and the crimes that they have committed and you know if some crimes are so heinous obviously they should you do the crime you do the time kind of thing but there's no rehabilitation and in and, and those soldiers in that Star Trek essentially, yeah, they were they did the bidding of the government and when they were of no use to them anymore, then they just cast them away and you know I don't know, it there has to be a way to find that common ground and even in society today, I think it's hard to find that common ground it, it can be done it's been done in the past it can be done in the present in the future which and, just says exactly the point is there has yeah. to be a way we yeah. don't hear that being that's not part of the discourse right, right, right. today the discourse and is, that's not is part of our separation narratives. and everything and and that's not necessarily the answer unity is where the answers lie yeah so. right you know yeah and it's just it's all over the place like you know and um in the darkness, you also had, you know, the Admiral who's going to militarize Starfleet, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, section yeah. 31. I never liked Section 31 either because it was it was kind of like that idea where mm-hmm. you had these people who were, you know, radicalized, you know, instead True. of taking the high road, instead of saying, nope, we are going to solve this problem, they would, we're going to start Section 31 and we're going to start, you know, spying on, you know that speaks to a lot of political things you know in yeah, this world it's just and, not okay you know it's not Roddenberry Star Trek it's, it's not, not Roddenberry's positive vision. humanism it's yeah it's not saying how we can work together you know i we need Star Trek to be a beacon of hope we need to see a future that's possible we don't need to see necessarily we can see metaphors or whatever you call it for how things are in real life, you know, but we, Star Trek was always, like you said, a way to positively work together and work through those issues Mm -hmm. of the day and just make them solvable or, you know, find some kind of solution. So... So on that note, there's uh, it's not completely hopeless with the new Paramount Star Trek stuff with you know CBS and Moonves not being interested in developing Star Trek, and Paramount being interested in developing Star Trek but wanting to do it in this reboot. You know we're just gonna mix it all up because we're contractually obligated not to be like real Star Trek. Right. All right. So there's two possibilities. Um, Moonves is facing some allegations now that he you know, is guilty of sexual misconduct and harassment. Dear. So he may be out, <laughs> which would be Thanks. a good thing for Star Trek, possibly, if the person who replaces him is favorable to developing a new Star Trek series based on the canon, the catalog of Is it is Is it going to change the legal ramifications of what CBS and Paramount are we locked into no, that because, for eternity? No, because CBS, they have rights to all the old Star Trek stuff and can do a new television series based on the old Star Trek. So if they wanted to do, like, let's say, so they're not just something based, movies. which is what the fans have always wanted, yeah. is a new series based in the TNG Voyager DS9 era. Yes. Like, what would be the next thing right after that with a new crew and a new ship? Or new I, I wouldn't mind. At this point, I, we've gone backwards with Enterprise. Let's go forwards from Next Generation. Yeah, yeah that's what everybody's saying. You so know, CBS could do that. They could do it's that. It's just Moonves, as leading the company, is not interested in that. He's interested in, and here's the other possibility. So let's say if Moonves stays or if whoever replaces him wants to carry on his mentality, they're, what they're 
CBS and Paramount are working on at the moment. Mm-hmm. Paramount with Kurtzman and, and et al. being involved, since they have to be different right. than real Star Trek, they're trying to figure out how to take control of as much of that property as possible mm-hmm. and steer it in their direction. So here's what I've heard is going is the is kind of the impetus why they're floating the ideas of a Quentin Tarantino R rated Star Trek. Why they're doing maybe, a new Picard series, you know, why all this stuff. Maybe they're putting feelers out there to see how the fans to see what the fans will bite, you know. So what what I've heard is that it, this might be an engineering attempt to try to replace the CBS catalog in, entirely. So if they can just wow. get CBS as far out of the picture as possible, then they're basically going to just rewrite everything from, you know, it's not going to be the Kelvin timeline is probably petering out. And so they're going to do something brand new, use the Picard series as the vehicle to introduce this hybrid Kelvin prime Star Trek thing that's like going to be, you know, this bastardized version of okay, an amalgamation. Gonna, well, you just you just said it right there. How, what your thoughts are on it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I mean, do you I think just, there's a possibility? Is there hope? Is there hope that yeah. th- that they can? If Moonves gets the boot and the new person who comes in decides to do what the fans want, which is you know develop a post TNG era. Star Trek series with new characters and all that. Now, how do you fit that in with the movies? Do you take it past Nemesis? Well, see, CBS doesn't have the okay. rights to the movies. That's Paramount. Okay. Okay. So, so I don't the, know what would happen. That you know, again, they that, have the TV show. The thing is, here's I'm, this it's is my personal so, thing. All right, my personal so gripe. So dang confusing. Yeah. Right. Exactly. But my personal gripe is that Star Trek has always worked on television better than in movies. In my personal opinion. Well, the thing is, in part of the J.J. Abrams, uh, J.J. Trek, as you call it, Mm -hmm. is that people these days, they're looking for more explosions and stuff, and they don't want to see a film like maybe Insurrection that didn't have as much action, but it had more, you know of the spirit of the next generation, like the episodes where you have an hour of television, you can develop, or even in a two parter, you can develop a story and you can, but when you have two hours or so on, on film, you've got to crunch that down and you know about making movies, how you've got to make, Mm -hmm. make it all fit. And I think maybe they're losing something there because it's, it's much harder to, for it to translate to film. Because you can't, you don't have time to spend on all the characters that you'd like to spend on them. They're two different mediums. Uh, right. Because a film needs to be a standalone story, and it's usually longer, you know, mm-hmm. an hour and a half, two hours. And with television, it's episodic. It's like a. Right. An, so it's, you can have a story arc over and, uh, an entire season if you want to or whatever. It gives a know. lot more options with character development. Yeah, yeah the, you that get was the delve big, huge deeper thing into it. with, you know, the the three next generation era series mm-hmm. it's like you'd have a show on this character all right and then next week you'd have a show on that character right, right. and it would give you lots of time to well, really get deep into who the how you talked were. about picard the new picard series or whatever coming over and maybe hopefully that being in the prime or even if it's Prime or Slash Kelvin or whatever. If Paramount's involved with it, yeah, it is so not going to be. Prime. If Kurtzman is involved, but, it's but not going to be. But the point is, they kind of did that in, in the Prime in in the Prime universe from Next Generation on the first episode, obviously of Deep Space Nine was a, a, a good setup, you know, where they had Picard come over. So I think they're trying to repeat history. But they're doing it with the Kelvin universe, which is a different universe or whatever it's going to be called or whatever. And I don't know that it's going to work. I don't think you can get lightning in a bottle, like, you know, to strike twice or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, catch lightning in a bottle. Yeah. And it worked in the prime universe when you stayed in that prime universe. And DS9 was darker at the time. It was in the 90s. And so it made it made sense for it, yeah, you know, the early 90s. <laughs> I, I know. That I know. kind of dark is not the 
you know. I know, but it's not the dark. It's dark. not the same discovery. Yeah, discovery is way dark. You know, it's like Batman on antidepressants or something. I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, <laughs> I don't. Know. I was trying to imagine what that would be. Yeah, yeah. 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 go ahead. I'm just mad. <laughs> I'm mad. I'm just really mad. Um, I, I get this like image of somebody who's just you know hates the world and themselves, and then but is also doped to the point of being. Like they don't care. <laughs> Are you talking about the executives? <laughs> uh, but may, I don't know, but maybe I don't <laughs> but know. But anyway, yeah, I don't know them personally. I don't want to. Yeah, yeah it's, this is not personal. It's just from a fan point of view. It's like, what do we want to see? What I want to see in Star Trek? I want to see, especially Picard, such an interesting character. I, I am good with them changing it and taking him in a new direction. I don't want to retread of the next generation, but I want it to feel like it fits chronologically and thematically with the Picard we know. Don't take Picard and say, oh, here's this wonderful character. Everybody loves this captain. Let's put him in Kelvin universe or ultra universe or whatever they call it. It's super dark and see how he plays. I don't want to see that necessarily. Or if he, if they do that, I want him to be that beacon of hope. I don't want Picard to be this old curmudge and, you know, I, I want to still see that Roddenberry spirit, which, you know, may be dead at this time. I hate to you say know, that if Alex Kurtzman is involved, which is at the at this point, he is in charge of anything Star Trek, CBS or Paramount. It's like he's the dude um, with the new series, these new TV series. He's the guy. If as long as that stays the way it is, we're not going to get... Roddenberry Star Trek, period. It's just not going to happen. He's into Prestige TV, Westworld, you know, Game of Thrones. Let's do that. Anakin, you're breaking my heart. You're going down a road I can't travel. No, I just <laughs> I just think that there's going to have to be a, a no, regime no, no. change. Well. <laughs> and Moon, Vez, and Kurtzman are have to get, get out of the picture. And if that happens, then we got some, you know, good stuff. Happening. What I've heard Patrick Stewart say, and again, this is, completely speculation because they don't even know what they're doing at this point. Right. You know, it's just, they haven't seen a script or anything. And and he was just, but they must have promised Patrick Stewart. He's not a money grubber or whatever. I'm trying to be nice in my term of words. Yeah. But he's done some weird creative stuff recently, but but good, good for him, you know, to, 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 he's an actor and you know, actors, they should be able to try different things. But if he's coming back to Picard after years ago where he said he felt he was done after Nemesis, he mm. felt that he had done everything with Picard, they must have pitched something to Patrick Stewart. I trust Patrick Stewart enough as an actor. that, And I'm not saying, yeah, he's just an actor like everybody don't take money. But I'm saying I trust that he loves that character enough and he feels the kind of person he is as an actor he's not going to do a disservice to Picard. I mean, they may, there may be a part of where we see an arc, but he, he's going to find that positive, that good part of Picard, and he's going to show that. He's not going to come back and play Picard, a, a, a drunken, you know, really womanizer or something, you know, totally well, anti-Picard. It's really not up to him. I mean, it's mostly it's not the up showrunner to him, but and the writers. I feel like they've initially promised something they've had to show him some very generalized timeline or or, or story arc i, I have think no idea what they've discussed. i have no idea and I, it's pure Behind speculation but i don't think he would blindly just say okay i'm on the picard ship so here's what i've heard patrick yeah. stewart say and that's all i can base this on right. is what stewart has said public, publicly which is that this could be a different Picard altogether, and this could be a completely different thing. Just different, different, different. That different. worries me. And, and excites okay, me. Okay, well, I'm not interested, thank you. Because if they can't bring the character back, the, okay, he said 20 years, you know, which, you know, in all good things, they actually covered. All right, all right if they're not going to stick with that, I'm not interested because it's going to be, all right, so Kurtzman involved. It's not going to honor the timeline set forth in All Good Things, which is the final episode of the right. Changing series. Which is brilliant. Then, you know, if they're not going to say, okay, well, what happens in between, you know, the Nemesis and All Good Things? Because, you know, he and Beverly got married and then 
got right. divorced, and then um, you know Data started teaching at Oxford. And, you know, so they uh, if they're not going to honor that that history that I'm right, and it's not they're not going to be the same characters, and it's not going to be that he cannot he shouldn't say Picard is back. I'll say that. I mean, and that that's a, that's a, a, va- that that's a, a very valid thing. point, you know, and but you know we all got super excited and just oh my god, Picard's back. You know, this is exactly what we want, but be careful what you ask for. You know, it may be a Picard in chief's clothing or a wolf's clothing or whatever. They may name the character Picard, but it's, if if Stewart is saying he's not essentially Picard at his core, even if he's um, a distorted version of Picard, you know, like a beaten down or, you know, that can be interesting. But he, at his core, he still has to be, and I think that's what you're saying, Picard. You know. He may not be Picard on a starship, from what I'm hearing, you know, and that's sure. I don't expect that. Fine, you know, I, mean, you know, I don't expect on, that. He's not going to be a captain anymore. You know, I, I don't want to see him sitting behind a desk necessarily, but I want him to still have that same moral center. I want him to have that same optimism. He has to maintain those traits. Even if he goes through a small story arc where he has lost all of his faith in, he, in, the, in who he was – and in the future, and then he comes back to it, you know, but... I hope they don't do that. <laughs> well, I know, I know. I, I don't, there's, there's something more creative that can be done here. There is. Sure. I mean, but I want him to push it forward. I want him to push the story forward into mm-hmm. new territory, and I want Picard to, to be, if he's not commanding a starship, I want him to have an influence or... Or I almost see him going out there as being maybe an archaeologist or following some of those other that passions be, that he had. That's a great idea. Actually, I think somebody said that on the internet, so I don't know that I can necessarily take credit for oh, that. Yes. But, but I would like to see him <laughs> pursue some of those passions that exactly. now he's not a captain and he's 20 years on. He said, you know what? I'm not getting any younger. Man, that just wrote itself because it's like, yes, he goes into archaeology. Then he is forced in some situation. And then he's where he Indiana has Jones' as, dad. As he has to re, no. re, he has to go back <laughs> to his uh, no, no, his job as a diplomat. Yeah, that's what. We yeah, do. you know he could be the Earth and <laughs> like the Romulan ambassador or the, or the Vulcan ambassador. He could be like the Earth ambassador. Mm. You know, Ambassador Picard. Uh, Picard. Uh, yeah, I said it right. Mm. <laughs> but you know, I, I want to see something like that. I want to see him going to strange, new, and different worlds mm. or whatever, and and ex- and. Ex- exploring other things he doesn't necessarily have to explore with a starship that would be cool but he can explore this is picard it's about picard it's not about the enterprise necessarily it's about picard and i want to see picard explore picard you know and what what he would do let him loose in a positive this positive light in and push him in 20 years in the future like we have and let's see where he goes with it and and there's wonderful potential in that I I feel so I hope so yeah so what, that's all I got that's so. all you got yeah okay hopefully well, hopefully we get something good but we've got something. from what we're talking right what they're talking right now with you know things are it, not it worries so me good. yeah I'm always worried about reboots and different timelines and you know in don't call it the prime timeline if it's not you know don't don't dress it up as if it's a chicken, let it be a chicken. Don't dress it up as a dog and tell me it's a dog chicken. You know, I, I don't like that. I, you know, necessarily, you know, I, I, I don't mind seeing new and different things. I want that. I think the fans want that, but we want it to be true to the characters and not at the, their core still has to be the same. They still have to retain that core of who they are. You know, so he can't become the Car- Bacard the ninja. You know, <laughs> that would be just wrong, you know. Yeah. So alrighty, is I think that's everything we've got to cover for this for yeah. now. Hopefully, uh, are, like are I we said, good? Is there anything else you want to add? Uh, no, I just yeah. Okay. <laughs> Other well, than uh We're gonna come back probably on a different episode and we're gonna get to our Top episodes of all the Star Trek series. Yeah, that'll be a good discussion. I've been revising my list. Hours. <laughs> I, I know, and I'll be 
revising again. And I know this is going to end up being a super long episode, but it's a very it's important it. one. It's been a long time coming, and we're going to be talking more about Star Trek. So I want to thank you, Jesse Perry, filmmaker, visionary, uh, whatever no, else you want. Yeah, no, just, no. Jesse's good. <laughs> just, just Jesse from the Prime uh, timeline. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I want to thank you for joining me here, Ed, uh, a.k.a. Savage Tech Man, here on Geek Home World Podcast. And uh, remember, you can check us out, geekhomeworld.libson.com. Leave your comments there if you want. We're on iTunes. You can uh, eventually see or hear this video, more than likely here, because I don't think I can... It's not necessarily a, a video, but it will be on our YouTube channel where you can leave comments there. I know we've got some some good Star Trek followers there. I'd love to hear your comments, your feedback. So, did you want to talk about next episode being 100? Well, we that's true. This planned. is this is our 99th episode of the podcast, and our next episode will be episode 100. So, that will possibly, probably, maybe include these top. Um, it may include a lot of things, but it, it's going to include these top video. episodes of Star Trek. So, And it may be a video episode, so we're working towards that. We were kind of planning something, but we're, we're working on it. So I'm slowly trying to develop that YouTube channel over there. But just check us out. Hit that subscribe button. And I want to thank everybody for listening. And thank you, Jesse, for joining me today. Thank you. All righty. And we'll see you out there. Awesome. Awesome. Engage. Bye. Engage. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Geek Homeworld with your host, Savage Tech Man. You can find us on Libsyn, Google Plus. Follow and interact with us on Twitter. Like us on Facebook. Listen to us on iTunes and leave a review. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Read our thoughts on Blogger. See you again on the Geek Home World.